Good morning. Good morning. This is a uh, meeting of the Los Angeles City Council. Today is Friday, July 7th. Uh, we meet on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, today, uh, the first Friday of the month, uh, we do a meet in the City Council chambers in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, today, uh, we have a number of presentations. I'd like to uh, first uh, acknowledge uh, Mr. Cardenas for our first presentation. As we're getting ready, just for those of you that uh, cannot be here, you can uh, clearly see us on Channel 35 or go to our website to be able to access our City Council uh, meetings. Uh, Mr. Cardenas. It gives me great pleasure and honor to uh, bring forward someone who's very shy, uh, Jonathan Bogna, who's a student at Bird Middle School. And... Uh, Many of you may have read the article that came out in the Daily News, which talked about how Jonathan was a bit of a shy kid, maybe wasn't uh, the best student, but when a contest came about, a national contest, about writing an essay, he approached his teacher and asked his teacher if a poem would suffice. And the teacher, a bit surprised that Jonathan was inquiring about doing extra work, uh, looked at him and said, well, it doesn't say anything that poems won't work. So he put together a poem. He stayed up late nights. He worked very hard. And when you hear the passage that he's going to read for you, you're going to see that this poem is very heartfelt. It's very accurate. It's very insightful. And more importantly, it's a message that our young people, every young person in this city, every young person in this community is affected by gangs. Jonathan is not a gang member, doesn't hang around with gang members, isn't involved in that kind of lifestyle. But he certainly knows enough about it to put together a poem that's recognized nationally. And I think it's important for us to realize that Jonathan has opened my eyes, I hope he opens your eyes to understand that we have responsibilities to make sure that we protect all of our children and that we understand that gangs not only affect gang members, that gangs not only affect the families of gang members, but gangs and that kind of activity affects everyone. And this contest was about that issue. And it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce to all of you Jonathan Bogna, who's our representative. They had a girl and a boy. He's the boy. Uh, from LAUSD to represent us nationally. And in Washington, he's going to be going to Washington soon. But his poem, along with all the poems collected from all the school districts around the country, is going to be put into a book in Washington. So Jonathan not only is a poet, not only is he an aspiring good student, but he is now going to be published which uh, most people, you have to get their PhDs before that happened. So I'm going to introduce to you someone who has a PhD in his heart and someone who certainly understands what it is to be part of a community and understands what it is to give your thoughts and your mind and your heart into something and to represent us well. Jonathan. Oh. First, I just want to introduce my mom and my dad, Willow, William and Fabiola. Say a few words. Read a piece of your poem. Um, Why'd you do it? I mean, uh, well, it was a contest, and I was really interested in it because before that, I, I had been observing how Lots of things like this happen all around school and around, well, my neighborhood. And it was, I guess, um, something that I've just been seeing for a long time. I just finally wrote it down and got it somewhere. And I'm just going to read a stanza like halfway through it that a lot of people liked. 
At the end, there is no, no prize, not a reward, but there is a surprise. What has two holes and comes in a pair, handcuffs and an attachment of despair. At the end, the graveyard gains a soul. All the family gets is an empty hole. That stanza um, was got the most compliments from my peers and teachers that read it. And, yeah. Anything else? Mm-hmm. What do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, oh, yeah, when I grow up, I want to get into culinary arts or something in that section, or criminal justice. Cool. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas, we do have two colleagues before they leave, before okay. your family oh, leaves. On. Jonathan. 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 See how shy he is? Yes. Come on, man. You're going to be in the limelight quite a bit. Get over here. Let me acknowledge uh, Mr. Reyes, followed by Mr. Alicon. I just wanted to rise, Jonathan, and your parents and say uh, thank you for your your message. I just want to say thank you for your message, Jonathan, and the parents. Uh, I know how tough it is at this age with the peer pressure that exists, and it takes a lot of courage to be able to speak your mind and, and be thinking about what the others will think, especially when the uh, popular thing to do tends to be a destructive thing. And you have risen and taken that step and say, that is wrong and these are the consequences. So I understand why that stands as so important. So I congratulate you for your courage. I congratulate your parents for their hard work and their courage and making sure that they're raising a son that, and daughter that's as strong as you are. Congratulations and good luck in the future. Mr. Alicone. Yes, Jonathan, I wanted to, uh, to lend my congratulations and a particular pleasure. Uh, as we were talking before, I told you I grew up just a block away from where you live. And uh, Frank Martinez, our city clerk, uh, I believe grew up even closer than uh, I did to you. And uh, he actually attended Bird middle school uh, and uh, the neighborhood has changed since uh, my uh, parents built the house on Wick Street uh, in 1954 uh, and so your, your, your writing is exemplifying that change. It's, it's saying what is going on uh, even in the minds of, of uh, good kids having to worry about things like gang violence is not uh, something that that should be part of your lifestyle and it challenges us as city council members to uh, do a better job to uh, reduce uh, the opportunities for you to be thinking about things like violence and gangs and and uh, and graveyards and thinking about uh, opportunity and hope and jobs and and uh, good things in the future uh, so uh, your your message is very powerful especially coming from somebody so young uh, I have a feeling that uh, you're going to be making your mark and uh, continue to make your mark on the world. Uh, and uh, knowing that it comes from, from my neighborhood uh, makes it very special for me. Uh, but I want to commend you. I also want to uh, please uh, extend uh, the congratulations to Bird Middle School. Uh, they've uh, gone through a major transition over the last 10 years. The principal is doing a great job. Uh, he's a tough guy, but, but he's uh, actually uh, transform that community, uh, the, the community of Bird Middle School, and uh, and uh, good luck uh, at the new high school uh, that uh, you'll have an opportunity to attend in just a few years. Take care. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as you can see, Jonathan is a, a cool customer. He's a good kid, and he certainly has, when he, he realized, when he put his heart and soul into something, he actually rose to be the best. And I think it's a great testament to all of our children to be able to honor him and to show the children who watch Channel 35 or whoever else is filming this, to let people know that that's all our children need to do. But first of all, as adults, we have to give them challenges. Jonathan didn't make this contest. Jonathan met this contest. And it was some good adults who decided to have this contest. Contest, and in that, Jonathan has found himself and found and realized that he has a tremendous talent. 
There are very few poets who actually can make money uh, in their job, but don't despair. I actually happen to know one. A very smart man married uh, my sister Trini. My brother-in-law, uh, Luis Rodriguez, is actually a published poet, and he actually makes a living at it, and he lives here in the San Fernando Valley. So what I'd like to offer to you, Jonathan, is several things. If you'd like to meet him and find out what it's like to be a poet and actually do it full-time, I'd be more than happy to arrange that for you. In addition to that, I want to give you this certificate of congratulations to you so that you can put it up and people could know that you actually did this. It's for real. And what I'd also uh, like to ask of you is I'm going to get your poem uh, on a nice uh, piece of paper. And what I'd like to do is have you sign it, if you would, please, so I can have it in my office all the time in the front of my office so that when people see it, they say, who's this? What's that? I will tell them your story, okay? So I'm going to make sure that people know about you. In addition to that, uh, just a couple of days ago in Ohio, a young lady that I started to mentor about three years ago, she's one of the top golfers in the country. She just got a national recognition. One girl and one boy around the country, golfers, uh, little teenagers, and she is the number one girl to be recognized for her service to this community in the San Fernando Valley. And I will, will promise you, if you would like me, it would be my honor to mentor you. Would you like that? Sure. Cool. So we're now buddies. We're now buddies. So Jonathan and I have just started a relationship and him and I are going to get to know each other better and always know this, I will be there for you. Anything you want to do, anybody you want to meet, if you want to meet Tiger Woods or what have you, I don't know if I can make that happen, but I'll make the call for you. I'll make that call for you. So congratulations, Jonathan, and uh, you've earned this. And also to his family, thank you so much. And I also owe it to one more person, the reason why we're doing this presentation. My number one constituent, my wife Norma, when she read this in the Daily News, she looked at me, and with one look I knew what I had to do. We need to honor Jonathan. And I said, absolutely. I'm glad I thought about that. Congratulations, Jonathan. Thank you, Norma. Congratulations. Nancy. And his little sister Nancy's here too, as well as his friend. Oh, you're older than him? I'm sorry. You're <laughs> shorter than him. Okay. You going to Poly? I am in Poly. Oh, Poly High School. We have two of the, them are going to be at Poly High School next year. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Today, I have the honor of uh, presenting on behalf of the City of Los Angeles, the Council of the City of Los Angeles, Frida Kahlo Day. Uh, and this presentation, I'll be joined by the Consul, Consul General de Mexico in Los Angeles, an Honorable Señor Ruben Beltrán. Okay. And uh, I'll give the consul an opportunity to introduce his colleagues as well who are here with him. Let me tell you a little bit about Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo was born Magdalena Carmen Freida Kahlo y Calderon on July 6, 1907, in her parents' house in Coyacán, Mexico. She lived in a time of incredible worldwide movements and changes, particularly in post-revolutionary Mexico. Kahlo's enthusiasm on social causes transformed her life and made her both a successful painter and a social activist. As we all know, Kahlo was married to world-renowned Mexican muralist Diego Rivera. However, she was able to forge a place in art in the art world that was completely her own. Her art reveals the beauty uh, and nature of the world of womanhood, and her life and paintings became the reflection of the multicultural identity of Mexico. Frida Kahlo represents one of the most talented painters of the 20th century. To, com to commemorate the centennial birthday of Frida Kahlo, the government of Mexico and the Mexican General Cons Consulate in Los Angeles have organized a series of programs and activities devoted not only to celebrate her birth, but also disseminate her uh, cultural legacy in Mexico, Los Angeles, and the rest of the world. Today, on her hundred, which would have been her 100th birthday, the Los Angeles City Council, along with the mayor, declares July 6, 2007, as Frida Kahlo Day in the city of Los Angeles. I have... 
I have the honor of announcing this wonderful day in honor of Frida Kahlo, but someone who knows a lot more about the activities that are going to ensue, and I'd like to invite him to the podium to uh, explain to us what we're going to be uh, presented with in the city of Los Angeles on behalf of Frida Kahlo, El Señor uh, Ruben Beltran, Consul General de Mexico. Thank you, Councilman Cárdenas, Madam President, Council, city, members of the City Council, thank you so much. It is uh, unavoidable, Madam President, when thinking of Frida Kahlo, thinking of you and your esteemed colleagues, Jan Perry and Janice Han, who are today with us, because you, as Frida Kahlo, you that just received uh, the Deborah Award just a few days ago, congratulations again, Madam President, are uh, social fighters as Frida. And you know very well what it represents being a woman and fighting for a good cause and fighting for social justice. And Frida Kahlo was about that. And I'm very much appreciative to the City Council that declared today the Frida Kahlo Day here in Los Angeles. Frida Kahlo, as, as Councilman Carden has said, is a, was just, not just a wonderful artist, one of the most wonderful artists worldwide in the 20th century, but also she was a, a true humanitarian. She fought the best causes. She was there at the early 20th century fighting the good causes for social justice in my country. But Frida Kahlo represents the best values of all women in the world. Frida Kahlo represents that woman that wants to be free, that woman that wants to fight for the freedom of the countries, the fight for social justice. And whenever you see a painting of Frida Kahlo, you will feel that struggle of her, struggle against adversity, a struggle against social inequity, struggle against incomprehension, struggle against all those who uh, were dominating the world at that point in time. And uh, I appear before you, Madam President, esteemed members of the City Council, accompanied by a number of Mexicans that live here in Los Angeles. I come here with not only with my colleagues of the consulate, but also distinguished uh, community leaders that come here because we are very grateful to the city of Los Angeles. We are very grateful that Los Angeles is uh, a friend. Los Angeles as a city is a friend of Mexico. And this is a gesture of friendship. This is a gesture of solidarity that we treasure. So we are very honored deeply grateful to the city of Los Angeles, to all of you, and uh, we thank you for having that uh, gesture towards Mexico. So on behalf of the Mexican government, on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of Mexicans that live in the Southern California, particularly city of Los Angeles, we thank you, and it will be an honor to show and display this proclamation in the consulate so everybody would see that the city of Los Angeles was extremely sensitive to those, those universal values that Frida Kahlo represented. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, on behalf of the Mayor of Los Angeles, the City Council of Los Angeles, and the people of Los Angeles, we declare today, July 6, 2007, Frida Kahlo Day, in honor of you, in honor of both of our countries, and in honor of the fact that Frida Kahlo didn't fight just for Mexico or the United States. Frida Kahlo fought for everyone throughout the world. As you said, Consul, she was ab ab about fighting for the general respect of women, the general respect of the downtrodden, the gen general respect and appreciation, appreciation of, of all human beings. So with that, we honor her gladly. Congratulations. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Mr. Reyes, sorry. Ms. Councilman Cardenas, I wanted to rise and again thank you for making this day possible as a sponsor in our council. I want to thank our Consul General Beltran for joining us for such eloquent words. But I also wanted to just emphasize the, the notion of sacrifice that Frida Kahlo symbolizes. Those of us whose parents are immigrants, we saw what power and strength our parents, uh, our, our moms, endured. Uh, what, to bring us to a point where we could be in these positions to actually represent communities that for decades had no voice 
in the last 20, 30 years, we have now put ourselves in a place where we can talk about the suffering of women, the essentially the poverty that hits the woman when they are suffering in these kinds of environments. But just as important, uh, the struggle they go through when we talk about sacrifice, uh, what support is still needed to arise for their health, uh, for their sense of, of value and self-esteem. When we look at the issue of AIDS, one of the harshest, harshest uh, diseases that affect women who are Latinas, and it's a rising number, and it's a silent killer. When we look at heart diseases, the same thing for women, it's one of the largest and highest uh, uh, health issues that affect them. So Frida Kahlo re represents that struggle that we still endure today. The, the women from Juarez, uh, that particular situation in Mexico where we're learning of the women who disappear, who are found uh, in a very tragic state, something that still continues today. So you're right, it's not just about Los Angeles, it's not just about the Southwest, but about the impact that women feel when there is injustice. So Frida Kahlo, to me, speaks to those issues, and thank you for bringing that to light. Madam President, Madam President, uh, Council President Eric Garcetti couldn't be here today, but Eric Garcetti had as much to do with making this uh, um, Frida Kahlo Day as anybody, so I would like to give my respect and my gratitude to Council President Eric Garcetti as he's been working with the Consul and with the Mayor's Office uh, to make this happen. So if Eric were here today, he would be doing the honors, but since he couldn't be here, I was more than happy to be honored with this presentation. So to Eric Garcetti, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Council General, always glad to see you here in our council chambers. Mr. Smith. Uh, for a special present, uh, excuse me, a special presentation of someone in our audience, um, we have a city employee who has stepped up to a whole other level that we're really proud of. A neighborhood prosecutor here in the Van Nuys area, working for the city of LA, was recently elected in a landslide election to our new school board member, Tamara Gallatin, who is hey. sitting in the back. Tamara, would you stand, please? There she goes. Yay. There she is, way in the back. Thank you. Congratulations. It's a, a daunting task. I know. You've only been there a few days, and already you're feeling the tremendous pressure of serving on the L.A. Unified School District, but I know you'll do a great job. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and we're ready for your presentation, and welcome tomorrow. Okay. Come on, guys. That's all little ones, sir. Come on. You guys over here. Put it up. Everyone, we got lots of lumber. <laughs> <laughs> Killed a lot of trees for these. You may now kiss. Madam President, thank you for the time. We've been joined by some real community leaders here in a uh, an organization who has really contributed greatly to the life and style of, of the community here in the Central Valley and the Van Nuys area in particular, and two residents of my district who have been tremendous leaders. Bob Lombardo, under his leadership at the Grand Night of the Van Nuys Council of the Knights of Columbus, was recognized with the awards of the 105th Annual, 105th Annual State Convention of the Knights of Columbus on May 19th. The Van Nuys Council of the Knights of Columbus was awarded the highest state award given uh, to the council in this year as Council of the Year. Is that this one here? Yes, yes, this big one here? Council of the Year in the state of California. To put that in relevance also, if I'm not mistaken, there are 621 councils around the state of California. This council was the best in the state of California. They also won the award as the state deputy award, the council best membership total gain, number one first place membership, first place uh, church activities, second place for public relations, and third place in the state for uh, culture of life. Bob joined the Knights of Columbus after retiring from the baking industry in 2002, and he has since dedicated tremendous service to the council and the community as warden, chancellor, deputy grand knight, and now as grand knight. Bob established a vehicle donation program to raise funds for charitable causes, scholarships, and trips to Washington, D.C. for students at Sepulveda Middle School. Bob established the Father McGivney Fellowship Program for Scholarships for Seminarians. 
Bob, as Grand Knight, led the council in supporting numerous charitable and educational tournaments and events for children in our communities. Bob helped the council collect $8,000 in donations that were sent to the Philippines to help a young girl who needed a heart transplant, a heart operation, and help save the life. And did you have the pictures? There's the yeah, pictures of the young girl in the Philippines. Bob has been joined by his lovely wife in many activities over the years, and certainly uh, in the role of the Knights of Columbus. Sue Lombardo joined and became president of the uh, Columbianites, Columbianites, uh, the Columbianites, <laughs> the Women's Council of the Knights of Columbus. Uh, Sue so joined the uh, organization after retiring from banking industry also in 2002, and since dedicated tremendous service to the organization and the community as president. Suzanne led the organization in gathering donations to send victims of the Hurricane Katrina, Katrina as well as the 2004 tsunami. She led the organization in sponsoring a little girl from El Salvador to provide her with food, clothing, school supplies, and medical supplies. Also, they uh, knitted scarves and sweaters and blankets for the Pregnancy Counseling Center, Homeless Adults in Los Angeles, Battered Women's Shelter, and Union Rescue Mission, and Cancer Patients at Holy Cross Hospital. The Lombardos are tremendous assets to our community. I have known them for going on at least 20 years now. Um, we both had a lot grayer, or a lot darker hair back then. All of us did. Uh, at the time, Bob was president of the Sepulveda Homers Association, went on to be active in Councilman Burnson's Citizens Advisory Councils, which really were the predecessor of our neighborhood council system here in the city of L.A. They've been great supporters of the community in every endeavor they've been involved in, uh, organizations such as the Shutterbug Club and Camera Club and just anything going on in the community. The Lombardos were there. If there was a big uh, issue in the community, the Lombardos were taking leadership. When we changed the name to North Hills, the Lombardos were part of that issue. Uh, no matter what went on in the North Hills community, both Sue and Bob Lombardo were leaders in it, and it's evidenced today by what they brought home when they brought these trophies home with the Van Ice Council of the Knights of Columbus, that their leadership made a difference, uh, made our Knights of Columbus and Van Ice the best in the state of California, and we're very proud of them. And so we want to present them today with our resolutions from the city of L.A., if uh, we could have them right here, in recognition of their outstanding service to the community in general, also in particular to the Knights of Columbus and winning their state awards. Congratulations, Bob and Sue. Bob? Sue? Yeah. Bravo, bravo. And their wonderful friend. Thank you. We'll do that at the end. Okay. <laughs> Madam President, Councilman Smith, and all members of the City Council, Suzanne and I are very grateful for this honor this morning. We appreciate it. I also want to mention that we had a great team of people working with us, too, in the Knights of Columbus. And uh, we were very, very proud to know that uh, right here in the city of Los Angeles, particularly in the San Fernando Valley, the number one council of the Knights of Columbus right here in, in uh, our presence. So we thank you all very, very much for this honor. And as always, I want to thank Candida Marez, who keeps me informed always of what's going on in the council and keeps me involved, even though uh, technically it's not in my district. The, a great many of the people, such as Candido and the Lombardos, live in my district, and I'm very proud of them. So thank you, Candido, for your service. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Uh, we have one thank you very much, one Mr. Smith. For you. Oh, okay. uh, Madam President, uh, we do have a present, uh, presentation to make. Uh, our new current Grand Knight, uh, Tim Castanola, will do it. Madam President, Council Members, and especially Councilman Smith, I'm the new Grand Knight for Van Nuys Council. My, <laughs> many of the Council Members know my mom, Charlotte Castanola, who's very active in the community and in the school district. And my mom brought me up to do exactly that, to be very active in the community. And I found a great outlet in the Knights of Columbus. I think it's very appropriate that we honor the Lombardos here today. But also, we have a gift for the councilman. Oh, well, thank you very much. Take, well, take it out, Joe. Right. Uh, and councilman, we'd like to hit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give the councilman three hip, hip parades. Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Oh, it is a hip. <laughs> Well, you're always out in the community working. All right, my hat. <laughs> well, I like it. Thank I like you. that, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Yeah. We're going to go over. Everyone, take a picture. Over. Holy cow.
Our next presentation will be uh, by Council Member Alicon. Madam President, uh, Council Members, it's a pleasure to, to be here to recognize uh, a very well-known establishment in the San Fernando Valley, uh, but I'm, I'm focusing on a specific contribution that this uh, organization has provided to the San Fernando Valley for many, many years. It, it was when I was a city council member that uh, a sister by the name of June Wilkerson, where's this sister? Hi, sister. Um, came to me to describe a program that she had implemented at Holy Cross to remove tattoos from young people who had found themselves in the gang life uh, and wanted to get out of it and wanted to remove the signs of it. And more pragmatically speaking, they wanted to get a job uh, and were unable to because of the scarring uh, that, tattooed ha t that their tattooed bodies had, uh, had put them in the position uh, to be perceived uh, about. Um, so many young people uh, make poor decisions. I, how many of us have made bad decisions as teenagers? I know you're all looking at each other. But the fact is everybody's going to make mistakes. So many young people make mistakes uh, that they can't get out of without great assistance from our society. Many young people fall into the gang lifestyle including uh, tattooing themselves uh, even on the face and on the neck uh, and invisible parts of their body uh, and as a result uh, find it very difficult to get a job. And so s the sister was very passionate about this issue and she wanted to give these people a second chance. <clears throat> and so she created the tattoo removal program at Holy Cross Hospital I should say Providence Holy Cross Hospital in Mission Hills. And the program has been a tremendous success. Uh, initiated in 1998, uh, it uh, has contributed to a reduction in gang violence. It does provide an alternative. It does reduce the targeting uh, that occurs when people see somebody with a, a tattoo on their forehead and they're walking in the streets. Uh, they, they become uh, targets. Just the other day, I announced a reward for a young man who had a tattoo and he wasn't even in a gang, but the tattoo was so prominent on his neck that he could have easily been, been uh, misidentified as a gang member and he was shot in the streets of Panorama City and killed. And so this tattoo removal program is, is vital and there are ma many others have emerged uh, throughout the area. But this one in particular, I think, is deserving of, of this recognition. A couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, most of the people that are involved with this program are volunteers, including the doctors who remove the tattoos. Uh, but the total number of uh, volunteer hours donated to this program are 120,000 hours uh, by all the people involved. And I'll let some of the administrators talk a little bit more about that. Um, but it's a very expansive program. It affects people's lives. It gives them a second chance uh, after making uh, a poor decision earlier on. Uh, and uh, we do have some testament to that. So with that, uh, on behalf of the City Council, we want to present a recognition. But before doing that, I'd like to ask Mr. Dimitru uh, Alexu, the Associate Director for the Center for Community Health Improvement and the coordinator of the Tattoo Removal Program at Providence Holy Cross to say a few words. Dimitri. Madam President, uh, Councilman Alarcon and the rest of the City Council, I want to thank you for this great honor. Um, the Tattoo Removal Program has been around now for eight or nine years, um, started by Sister June, but the need is just as great as ever. Um, what we do is we remove visible tattoos, but not just removing a tattoo, we give individuals hope, a chance at a fresh start, 
And this is just one example of the many great programs that Providence Holy Cross gives to our community to meet the needs of what our community really needs. And I'm just going to say that, and what I would like to do is introduce Virginia Gomez, who's my assistant, and she is a living testament in terms of the lives that the uh, program does seek to change. Thank you. Good morning to all. Uh, my name is Virginia Gomez, and I am an employee here at the Tattoo Removal Program. Um, I'm very excited today to let you know about this program and how it's affected me in my life. After 15 years of gang affiliation and drug addiction, I decided in April of 99 to change my life. The change wasn't just from the inside that needed help. It was from the outside because at that time I was already had so many tattoos all over my body and my face and my neck and my hands and I had been at the same job for 10 years because my mom worked there so I kind of just grew up in the in the you know in the facility that I worked for and I wasn't able to go anywhere else because I knew if I tried they weren't gonna hire me so um, a little bit like mid 99 I found out about the program. Somebody had told me about the program, and I said, well, you know, I, I felt in my heart, I had already called a lot of places uh, to get estimates how much it would cost me, and it was almost impossible for me to um, come up with that money to remove my tattoos. So what I did is when I found out about this program, Sister June was, um, was uh, the one who ran the program, and um, I applied. They accepted me. I started my tattoo removal. In 2000, it took me two years to remove all my tattoos. I was a very faithful client, never missed an appointment because I was dedicated, and I knew that I, I was going to be a different person at that point. Well, um, in 2006, last year, beginning of 2006, I applied at Holy Cross for a different position that had been filled, but they called me and asked me if I wanted to work at tattoo removal. And to me, that was... Um, it was a blessing because I was able now, I'm able to give back to the program what they gave to me. And my goal in life now is to help people that were just like me to make that change and know that there is, there is a future. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, the program works. Virginia is a testament to that. Uh, I'd like to ask Sister June if, if, if you could make a few comments. You, you were the inspiration behind this program, and I know it was a slam dunk when you worked with the hospital to make this happen, and, and all the contributors just jumped to, for joy to help out. Uh, right. uh, no, but honestly, it was a very difficult process, uh, but this is an amazing woman. She's now retired, uh, but we, we uh, owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the thousands of people who are affected uh, and have improved their quality of life because of this incredible program. Sister June. Thank you. I want to thank the City Council for honoring uh, the people who are running this program now. It's, uh, it's incredibly uh, effective for those who want to get their tattoos off and, and move ahead. Uh, one fellow that I uh, had in the program when I was working with it had white power on his cheek. Now, He's not going to get very far <laughs> with that, and we were happy to remove that. Uh, the program is going very well. There's a, a division of it that goes to high schools and grade schools and gives presentations on the, to those students to help them understand that this not, might not be the best direction to go. And so I want to thank the City Council very much for this honor. Thank you very much. This program obviously wouldn't be possible without the uh, welcome uh, support of uh, the Providence Holy Cross Hospital. So I'd like to ask uh, the CEO, uh, Bob Schaefer, to uh, make a few comments as well. And we want to thank them. Uh, with all the other issues we're working on uh, with Providence Holy Cross, uh, uh, with uh, an expansion and, and other issues, uh, let's know that, that there's a lot of good work being done at the hospital. And, and this tattoo uh, removal program is something that hospitals uh, don't have to do. Uh, but by doing it, they're making our community so much better. So, uh, Bob? I'm sorry, Carrie. Uh, sorry. Thank you, uh, City Council. Um, one thing I would like to point out to the, about this program, which I find is just really outstanding and why it is a community-based program, for each treatment to remove a tattoo, that involves uh, 16 hours of community service. 
So this, this, this is not a free ride. These individuals who have committed their time and efforts to have their uh, tattoos removed are then out in the community working with the schools, uh, working with community services on a continuing basis to allow them to uh, generate enough uh, hours to get the next treatment done. So it is a self-fulfilling program um, that has, uh, that you've heard has been extremely successful. And we're out in the uh, high schools, in the junior highs, uh, we use our, our physicians are totally volunteer, our nurses are volunteer, and uh, we do see that it's making a difference in our community. And I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Councilman Alarcon for this great recognition of a great group of individuals who do this every day. Thank you. First, let me apologize. I introduced Bob Schaefer. Bob Schaefer and Carrie Carmody, who uh, just spoke, uh, they're both about 6'4", and, uh, and uh, I apologize for for uh, that faux pas. Um, uh, the, the Holy Cross system, the Providence Holy Cross system, is, is really driven uh, by uh, sisters uh, uh, of the Catholic faith, and, and there, there is a mission that goes beyond the bottom line uh, at this institution. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to ask Sister uh, Colleen Settles, uh, to, who uh, represents uh, that perspective, to uh, make a few comments as well. Thank you, Council Alarm Khan. Um, you're right, we do have a mission that says we care about the poor and the vulnerable. And we feel that folks who can't get ahead because of a decision they made at one point in their life, they are vulnerable. This whole process began at a time when the city was falling apart. It was very um, uh, disengaged. And, and it was at the time of Rodney King, the shooting or the, the um, beating of, with Rodney King with the um, police officers. The police came to the local clergy and said, help us and be in partnership with us in the community. So through that we developed a community clergy police advisory council. And being in, in a trauma center at Providence Holy Cross Medical Center, we worked hand in glove, as we still do, with the police officers. It was at that council, at that commission, that we saw the needs of the community in terms of tattoo removal. And we thought, you know, we are a hospital. We can work with the local police in this effort. So it was extending our mission to the police force that even gave birth to this program. So we are very happy to be able to full circle come today and be honored, and we are very grateful for you. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, also recognize the director of the uh, Center for Community Health uh, from um, the Providence Holy Cross, Ron Sorensen. Thank you so much and uh, continued uh, success. At this time, I'd like to present this uh, resolution on behalf of the City Council of Los Angeles. Uh, Eric Garcetti uh, wasn't here to sign it. We'll make sure you get his signature on it as well. But uh, this uh, is to recognize the tremendous contributions you've made in changing lives for the better uh, at Providence Holy Cross through your tattoo removal program, driven by volunteers, but really driven by a passion to improve our community and help those who uh, otherwise had made uh, bad decisions but who are making the right decisions today. Uh, Mr. Zine wants to speak, as Mr. Reyes would like to speak as well. Thank you, Madam President. I'll wait till they do the photo. Thank you. Before you uh, leave, a couple of us have some comments to make. Uh, I want to acknowledge Providence Holy Cross and uh, the other hospitals affiliated with Providence. I know that in my district, the Lymphoma Cancer Society, the Arthritis Foundation, every time we have something to help people, Providence is there. And the last event we had at Warner Center Park, uh, they were passing out these little devices to tell you how many steps you walk every day. <laughs> well, since I received this, it's been 8,730 today. I've lost 15 pounds following the Providence rule. So I want to acknowledge not only the wonderful work you're doing with the hospital, with the people who want to remove the tattoos, but all the other wonderful activities you're involved in throughout the city of Los Angeles, in particular San Fernando Valley. Any good cause that comes to your attention, 
you folks jump on board and support. So I want to acknowledge for what you've done for the tattoo removal, but also in addition to that, all the other wonderful programs you're involved with throughout the community to help people stay healthy and to stay out of the hospital and to keep healthy. So congratulations for this award and keep up the good work in the partnership with all the other associate organizations trying to keep people healthy in our wonderful city. Thank you all. And God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Madam President. I want to thank Councilmember Alarcon for bringing this group together at Providence. Uh, congratulations. Um, I know there are several hospitals I've approached about that idea, and it just wasn't done. Um, the cost issues were great. And in a day and age where our health system tends to dwell on the priority of, of the cost as opposed to the benefit of the community, uh, to hear this news and to understand the impact you're making truly is like opening up a window and letting some fresh air in to the health industry. Uh, our impact, the savings that we can accumulate over the long run when we have less kids identified by gangs as targets means less victims in your emergency operating room, which means lowering costs. So indirectly, you are benefiting that cost margin, but just as significant, you're changing the lives of some very young folks and folks who need a second chance. And for that, I thank you. And I'm hoping those who are listening and watching in the health industry can take heed to your example and maybe even call you up and say, how do you guys do it? Because we need more hospitals doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, there's no further speakers in the queue. Mr. Alarcon? Uh, I just have uh, one very important announcement. Everybody can get involved in helping this charity. And by the way, Dennis, uh, 50,000 more steps and you'll, you'll, be, you'll be fine. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, mention that the Bob's Big Boy in uh, Burbank, I think it's the, the very first Bob's Big Boy, um, uh, is having a charity of the month for this program, or actually, actually they, they have a charity of the month, and it's competitive. Uh, so I would like to ask everybody to contact Bob's Big Boy to put your vote in for this charity so that they can expand the opportunities to remove more tattoos, give more people opportunities to get good jobs, uh, and avoid the gang lifestyle. Uh, so uh, in order to do that, you can uh, vote by going online uh, at... Uh, HTTP uh, www.bobs.net at, uh, I'm sorry, charity, I'm sorry, slash charity, slash charity uh, dot HTML, uh, obviously hotmail. Uh, so um, uh, even uh, uh, ill, Ill, uh, low technology council member can figure this one out. Uh, please, if you otherwise would like to uh, uh, put your vote in, just contact my office at 213-847-7777. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Alarcon. Our next presentation is by Ms. Gruel. Good morning. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I have the. You can come closer over here. Okay. Um, and where's the is this other staff with you? Where's your staff? She's oh, she staff. can take the pictures. Oh, okay. That's your staff next to you, Andy Lipkis. Well, we're here today to honor um, an individual uh, that I've had the pleasure of working uh, with. Uh, when I was on the board of Tree People, um, and, and before that, a supporter of Tree People. He is an individual who has really committed his life to Tree People, I have to, have to say. Um, we are honoring him for his 18 years of service to Tree People. He served as the director of forestry and is a model of how one person can make a difference and whose work will benefit Southern California for years to come. He has helped re-knit the landscape of Los Angeles by planting trees and training and supporting and working almost every, it says every Saturday, it's so pretty much every Saturday morning with citizen forester volunteers throughout the community. And I've been there in the mornings where he is training them, educating them about how to plant a tree and even more importantly how to care for a tree. He has su supervised the planting of more than 100 thousand trees here in Los Angeles. And through his work, he has significantly improved the overall quality of life in Southern California by reducing air pollution in the city's air and water. 
Jim personally trained, inspired, and coached many Angelinos through the city permitting processes and formulated, organized, and carried out tree plantings and tree care events on city streets, school campuses, park woodlands, and in the mountains throughout the city of Los Angeles. The city is much greener through Jim Summers' work here in our community. He's a stellar example of what is possible when someone is committed and dedicated to not only their job, but even more importantly, I think this was more than a job, to the community at large and to greening Los Angeles and to making sure that we can do everything in our power to improve our air and to improve our community. Now, Jim, unfortunately, is moving to the Midwest uh, with his family and three, three children, um, and his wife is with him today and will be uh, greatly uh, missed. Um, we have a, a proclamation signed by all of the city council members because his impact is felt far and wide across the city of Los Angeles and through every council district. Um, so before we, though, present this to Jim, I'm going to ask Andy uh, if he would say a few words. Andy Lipkus, um, the father uh, of, of tree people. I am not calling you grandfather yet. Not the father of Jim Summers, no. Andy. Thank you, Councilwoman Wendy and all of you. Uh, I, I think it's so important to call attention to the role of an individual uh, who has touched so many lives in every single one of your districts. The, in this environment, we don't get trees automatically. It takes somebody doing it, and it takes individuals in every single block to say we have a dream about improving our community but to confront City Hall is is nearly impossible and it's taken um, an incredible coach friend comfort giver guide who not only trained all these hundreds of citizen foresters in, in every neighborhood but then counseled them on the phone late at night during the day to help them when you know when people said no or when their first request for a permit got declined it was Jim in every single case for all these years who was there to guide them through the process and then hold their hand all the way through not just planting day but planting is the first step the next step is getting people out on the streets to keep those trees alive to defend them to water them to mulch them because it just our environment is so harsh in this city anything you just put in the ground and leave dies you all know that most of you have been to his planting and so uh, the city can dwarf the effects of one person so often and it's it I thank you so much for the chance to be here today to honor the the impact of this one individual as he leaves to say we noticed uh, you will absolutely be missed by so many of us and so uh, I want to thank you for including uh, yourselves and the whole city and saying thank you and goodbye to uh, to somebody who by the way he he is moving with his family but there are cities all over the country who want to copy the LA model and our model and um, Jim will have a chance to work with and assist some of them uh, in ways that we haven't normally been able to do here LA dwarfs the rest of the country, so we'll be exporting something good to other communities. Again, on behalf of uh, the communities and with the council, thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Grill, we also have someone who wants to speak. Okay. okay. Go ahead. I was just gonna, I was going to introduce Jim. So you have some other people who want to say something? Yeah. No. Okay. So um, it is really my pleasure to present the certificate to, to you, Jim. Um, you uh, have changed the face of our city um, throughout the, this time, and there are children uh, and adults who have benefited from that. And someday we'll look in those communities, and you can proudly say uh, you changed it and you changed their lives by um, getting them as excited about trees as you are um, in the city of Los Angeles. So for your 18 years uh, of dedication to tree people, and more importantly, to the city of Los Angeles, we thank you um, from the bottom of our hearts. Congratulations. Yeah. Mr. LaBange. Thank you, Ms. Gruel and Andy Lipkus. Always great to see you. And Jim, thank you uh, very much, Jim, for what you did at Teaching People. And I remember the Saturday morning we were together in Toluca Lake, and, uh, and I... It's funny how I, I have a lot of different things, but I'm alone in a car when we pass, I pass areas, I think of the trees or whatever has been done uh, throughout. And when you come back with your children some days in the future to visit, 
you could show them uh, that you have deep roots in Southern California and you made a very profound difference because those who plant trees leave a very long lasting impact. Congratulations to you and your family and have a good new life in the middle of the country. Um, Ms. Gruel, if I might add also, um, uh, Andy and I were speaking before the uh, presentation today about whether Tim had uh, been the uh, mentor uh, in Vermont Square on the front porch of Helen Johnson in Vermont Square, and uh, I was there with him that day, and I, I can say firsthand that no job was too small or too large for Jim, and he mentored the folks who showed up that day and uh, really inspired them. And while our friend Helen has since passed, the tree still stands. And uh, every time I drive by that tree, I'll think of you and Helen. So thank you. Ah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all. And thank you, Wendy, uh, for all your support and all the different ways you've done it. When Wendy's come out to plant trees with us, she always gets dirty, too. So yes. that's always, yes. it's always a good sign when it's, uh, someone does that. And I want to thank, of course, most of all, Andy for just making sure there was a tree people and uh, giving me a place to land for about 20 years and do this work. Uh, Andy um, you know, created a place with a tone and a feel that matched how I felt about Los Angeles, about being optimistic and supportive and making sure that everything was possible if you just tried. And the power of volunteers was the other thing that was really important. So thank you to him. Thank you to all. And um, I'll still be around. Thanks. <laughs> right, thank you. I'm going to take a quick picture right yeah. here. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we have a quick, very quick presentation, very quick, by Mr. Labange. Gentlemen, it's uh, Friday, and it's always a good day to honor people in Los Angeles. And this young man, Michael Hughes, was a great intern for the last month in our office. He's a student at Loyola High School in Los Angeles. I want to salute him for the great job that he did. And please join and give him a big round of applause for Michael Hughes. Very good intern. Want to say, say something. Say hello to your parents. Well, I'm honored to get this great re reward. I'm so happy to be here today. I want to thank Mr. Labonge here oh, for presenting okay. me with this award. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Labonge. Uh, Madam Clerk, or Mr. Clerk, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, you know what I, okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> next order of business. That would be the roll call. Okay. Alicon, Cardinus, Gruel, Hahn, Weasel, Labonge, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Wise, West, and Zygar, Setti, 12 members present, and a quorum. Madam President. All right, thank you. Next order of business. Approval of the minutes. Uh, Mr. Zine moves. Mr. Smith seconds. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Ms. Han moves. Mr. Cardinus seconds. Madam President, do you wish to take public comment at this time? Yes, that would be fine. Let me pull the card. First speaker will be Sarah Mijares. Is Sarah... Mihadas? Next speaker will be Dan. Next speaker is Donna Pierman, followed by Miriam Fogler. Okay, City Council, I guess I won't speak again next Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, so it's backwards not having teleconference from San Pedro. The Social Security Office has teleconference from a different stage, which they do quite frequently. You're going against the Brown Act. Uh, I, again, I don't see, I don't see Eric Garcetti. I guess I don't get to meet him again. I need to bring up a big concern of mine. It's the MTA. Not everyone, City Council, not everyone can use the mass transit. A lot of rabbit stops don't have benches for the disabled to sit. Some buses don't have steps to get, uh, oh, some buses d still have steps to get up. Disabled are not guaranteed a seat on the bus. 761 rabbit, the Westwood is usually crowded to help. I usually have to sit in the back to get a seat. Sometimes I wait, have to wait some time to get that bus to go to work. While they overlaid Van Nuys Boulevard with local 233. Rabbit 720 goes from Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, along Wilshire Boulevard, 
slowly going downhill. One morning, several 720s going to Santa Monica was filled to the brim. One had to leave a man with a walker behind. I don't know if he got on a bus. I saw one lady literally get knocked to the ground by a young man running for the bus. I helped that lady by giving her a wallet that dropped when she was, when, uh, when she was knocked over. She's real shook up. This rabid 920 was gliding along with hardly one out on it. A lot of people can't use that bus. The stops are too limited. Not everyone's going to the beach. And I got lost on the 165. Asked the driver if he went to Fallbrook. He didn't. Uh, he thought I should know his route already. I'm learning to say we're relying these buses to get to work to and fro. The buses concern all 15 districts. I use the buses that literally go to several districts of my transit. It's concerned for the whole council. Sometimes I use Mad Transit to go to Van Nuys Council if I'm without my good friend Miriam. But if I go to Van Nuys next week, I'll see an empty chamber. Zoomer dog, you going to San Pedro? It's ridiculous not to have teleconference. Don't do that again. And folks, listen to ZumaTimes.com. Yay, yay. I had to turn the up. Uh, they'll keep the volume down if you hear them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Miriam Fogler. Uh, this gentleman came up to me. Good morning. Uh, anyway, the New Year's party, Fourth of July was good. Then is I'm perfect. Okay, thing is, I'm just worried about the hundred dollar seats not going to just select a few. I hope that's all for everybody that lives in the community. Bless you all heart. Okay, this gentleman came up to me, Daniel Gus. He wanted to say that the mayor is spending more time talking about his about his relationship that should be concerned about the the, the uh, duties of the city, taking care of our our city should be first at hand, not your personal life. Your personal life, you have problems, go to a counselor. That's what we all tell you, you know. And um, I see Bernie needs to listen to me because this is very important. Can I have your attention, Bernie? Excuse me, can you address your comments to the council okay, as a whole? I'm asking everybody's attention here, okay? It seems like um, there's only one person here. Okay, the uh, animal service head here, He's cut back the hours uh, full time, seven days a week to 14 hours, over a four or a four day week, four week uh, weekend weekday period. That's not very good news because that means they're going to be dumping a lot of animals, and they're not going to get treatments. And we need to have we need to have our the East Valley shelter to have uh, a cat shelter, the one on on Sherman Way. Near Kmart needs to be rebuilt there. Specifically, we need a separate place for cats because cats are in one little room and it's not fair. And by the way, that manager there, he said he's trying to stop the killing policy. You know, he's trying to stop it over there because I have a volunteer I know over there at the East Valley Shelter. She said it's not right what they're, uh, the cats are uh, crammed in and they need to um, stop the killing. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Brewer. Followed by Sheldon Walters, followed by Candido. Hi, um, Sharon Brewer, a little more warning, and I'd be more prepared. I was going to speak on Encino's election, but I'm not going to. Um, because you are here, um, I wanted to show pictures. I've been talking about the problems at Lake Balboa with parking. These are some of the cars that are parked inside the white um, posts. These cars are on the bike path. This is a picture of a car with the wheels on the bike path. It's a danger. Again, more cars inside these white poles that Recreation and Parks will not do anything about. These are cars on the grass. Parallel parked. They're supposed to be parallel parked, not like this. Here you have uh, kids on the bike path. Also the cars. Who's supposed to be there? It's a lawsuit waiting to happen. It needs to be taken care of. Again, more pictures. More pictures. CD6, something has to be done. We also have a problem with trash at the lake. Something needs to be done. This is trash waiting to go down into the L.A. River. Not supposed to go there. I have no clue how much. 
Also, this is a good picture. This is a picture of um, two wood ducks at Lake Balboa. And I have 26 seconds. Um, in Sino election, there are challenges that are, are, have been submitted. Um, Dunn still has refused to supply me the information that I requested. Um, the um, IEA for in, Encino election is refusing to supply me with information that I need for my challenge, which needs to be put in. And um, anyway, something needs to be done about the problems at Lake Balboa. Please, CD6. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, again, is Sheldon Walters, followed by Candida Morez, followed by Noel Weiss. Good morning, Madam Chair. Top of the morning. I want to commend you for your reappointment to be uh, President Pro Tem. I want to commend Eric Garcetti to be President again. I think those are excellent choices. I want to welcome Richard Alicon to the City Council. I want to commend you again for meeting and doing city business here in Van Nuys. I hope you haven't had too much difficulty getting here with all the traffic. Huh? Skag is given F for mobility for a second time, and and uh, this seems not to be getting much better. So perhaps if we expand our rail transit a bit, it might uh, help. Uh, now, I don't know if you've seen this article, National Geographic, in the June 19, uh, uh, 2007 issue. It says here, the big thaw, ice on the run, seas on the rise, global warming. I suggested to the MTA board of directors at their last meeting that they might uh, get some consultants and see about the possibility of harnessing solar energy or wind power for all rail and bus projects. Now, maybe here you might want to consider harnessing uh, solar energy and wind power to many city projects, Los Angeles city projects. As you know, LA area emits tons, tons of greenhouse ga gases, and that needs to be reduced. Uh, in this article here, it said that in about a century's time, if all the ice on Greenland melts, that uh, there would be about three feet of water worldwide. Think of what that would do to our Pacific coastline. I guess my time is You're, up. Yes. And, uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you. Candido? Candido? He may have left already. Noel Weiss. Uh, uh, members, good morning. Uh, my name is Noel Weiss. Um, I'm here basically to um, challenge again uh, the City Council, uh, not criticize. Um, but I wanted the public to know um, of the magnanimous effort that was undertaken by Herb West and on behalf of one of Mrs. Gruel's constituents, um, Chuck Tennant. Chuck nearly uh, died as a result of his uh, situation. He, when I say nearly died, I don't want to exaggerate, but basically he was involved in one of these Ellis Act evictions. He was in very, very difficult straits. Uh, what ended up happening, um, he applied for one of these uh, loans through the housing department, uh, just as it, uh, he, was, he was on the throes of being evicted. They ran out of money. Herb Wesson did a Janus Hahn, essentially forgetting the consequences. He found $5 million, not just for... Chuck Tennant, but for all of the tenants similarly situated. And what he did was on June 12th, and this only took eight days, and the public should recognize this is not a paid lobbyist, this is not somebody with influence, this is a guy who went to Herb Wesson with tears in his eyes saying, Herb, can you help me? And Herb introduced the motion, and all it ended up to be was a transfer of federal block grant funds from one account that was sitting there unused to the housing department. And by virtue of that, that took eight days, eight days, boom, just like that. Chuck got his money, and, and, and $5 million was basically there. Now, I think going forward, I think the councilwoman from that district, Ms. Gruel, needs to learn from this experience. She's on the budget committee. She knows there's no reason why that couldn't have been done. We're in situations now where we all have to grow. That's the challenge. Character is destiny. That's what the Greeks say. And the bottom line is, 
if we can accept the criticism, if we can basically move forward, learn from our mistakes, then I think we're all basically going to be better off. We want, Ms. Gruel, we want all of you to be the best legislators you can possibly be. And I'm hoping that basically this experience and this situation will inspire the public and also inspire the council to do the best job that they can do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Yes, you were out of the room when we called your name. Thank you, Madam President. Perfect timing. Uh, I just want again. I just want to thank you all for uh, allowing us to come before you and Councilman Greg Smith. Again, thank you for honoring uh, good working people in the in the uh, in the valley. Again, welcome to the San Fernando Valley. We appreciate you coming out here every uh, Friday. Um, I wasn't at the council last Wednesday, but I watched it from home. And I'll tell you, I was so proud of each and every one of you who talked about the 4th of July events that were taking place in your uh, community. I watched it from Porter Ranch, but I was able to see Woodland Hills. We saw the one in uh, Studio City, the one down in uh, San Pedro. But what was even more important was the fact that, that you were so proud of what was taking, uh, p taking place in your community. And that is so important, Madam President, that each and every day you show off your community and you show this is what we contribute to the city of Los Angeles. And that night we were able to enjoy all the festivities from uh, throughout the city. So uh, thank you on that. Uh, once again, I'd like to just um, talk about something that uh, some people may not want to talk about. But Mr. Del Didio is a human being. We all make mistakes. Uh, Al Gore's son just had a problem. I just wish that we have uh, more uh, forgiveness in our hearts and uh, allow the man to go on and do his job. And uh, again, each and uh, we're all human beings. So again, let's have forgiveness in our hearts. And again, thank you very much for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Candido. Uh, that closes public comment. Uh, Mr. Clerk, next item. On the regular agenda items one through eight are street lighting district items. Notice for public hearing. Thank you. Uh, anyone want to call those special? Uh, if not, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, please call the roll. Excuse me, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the votes. Twelve ayes. Those items have approved. And colleagues, uh, by the way, everything will be going forth with uh, today. Next item. Item nine is the PICO quarter BID notice for public hearing, and there is a request to receive and file that matter. Without objection, uh, we will receive and file item number nine. Next items. Items 10 through 38 are items for which public hearings have been held. On item 14, there's been a request to send that matter back to Plum. Okay, unless and, there's, okay. And on item 36, there's been a request to continue that matter one week to next Friday. Okay, that'll be next Friday. Yes, specials, Madam. Yes, um, Madam President, I would like to call 32 special. I know there's been a hearing, but I would like to move that we have another public hearing on item 32. Okay, we will call that item special. Yes, Mr. Alicone. Uh, 34 special. 34 special. Any other uh, items, uh, colleagues, that we'd like to call special? We've called item 32 and 34. And, Madam President, on item 37, the Budget and Finance Committee submitted its report, and the recommendations do differ from that uh, that's on file right now. I'll recognize Mr. Parks. Are we on 37 now? Yes, okay. 37 is right. We'd like to have move that the Budget and Finance Report uh, be adopted, but also want to add an instruction to that report that we direct the city attorney to investigate and report back on what the city's legal options are uh, because the uh, vendor did not or failed to comply with the RFP. And if we can ask that in that same 60-day period. I'll second that motion. Can you set it in the chair? So we, will, uh, we will amend uh, item number 37 and have the budget committee report Can be the one we adopt. The Any other specials, colleagues? I don't know. Okay. Okay. I got a if not, Madam Clerk. I asked a Robert the rule question. Yes. Can you second it from the chair? I, you know, I. Just I'm not interested in that. I'll Mr. ask the city attorney. Because um, if not, I'll second it if you. Not if not. <laughs> right? See, Mr. Garcetti did it before, but you may be right, Mr. Labonge. No, so I I I'll, I'll look to our city attorney. She, the council president in this body can, pursuant to the council rules, uh, in, in a, under a different type of parliamentary body where the uh, parliamentarian, the president, does not uh, get a vote, then that uh, parliamentarian would not be able to uh, second it. But in this case, So she's yes. correct. Yes. So I withdraw my question. That's right. Well, thank you for that thank question. You, I, I thought for a moment about that as well. So. Um, Madam Clerk, if we could open the roll on the remaining items. Close the roll. Tabulate the votes. Twelve ayes. Those items are approved. Next item. 
Items 39 through 53 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Item 39 is a commission reappointment. Do you wish to hold that on the desk? Please. We do have cards on items 45 and 52. Uh, those will be called special. Any other specials, colleagues? If not, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, please open the roll on the remaining items. Close the roll. Tabulate the votes. Twelve ayes. Those items have been approved. Next items. Madam President, do you wish to recess the regular meeting and uh, take up the special meeting? Please. Alicon, Cardinus, Gruel, Hahn, Weasel, LaVange, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Weiss, Weston, Zion, Grissetti, 12 members present, and a quorum, Madam President. Thank you. First order of business. Items 54 through 56 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Item 54 is a commission reappointment. Do you wish to hold that on the desk? We'll hold the commission reappointment on the desk. Any specials, colleagues? If not, Madam Clerk, open the roll on the remaining items. Close the roll. Tabulate the votes. Twelve ayes. Those items have been approved. Do you wish to continue the one item to the regular meeting and adjourn the special? Please. And that would take you back. Do you wish to take up the commissioners first? Yes, we will take up commissioners first. Item 39 is the reappointment of Ms. Sandra Martinez to the Commission for Children, Youth, and Their Families. Is Ms. Martinez here today? Oh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Madam uh, Chair, members, I uh, strongly recommend this appointment of Mayor Vera Gosa uh, to the committee. Uh, the uh, Commission of Children, Youth, and Family. Ms. Martinez, would you like to express yourself at all? Sure. Uh, good morning, and I just want to thank uh, Councilmember LeBange and the committee for waiving consideration and bringing me forward. I also would like to thank the council overall for reconsidering my appointment, and um, I'm looking forward to three more years of service to the city. Thank you. Members, I ask for an I vote. Thank you. Um, Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Madam President. Um, being that you've been there three years? No, no. Oh, you... Only 16 months. 16 months. Uh, no, wait. Not even. Yeah, 16 months. A little over a year. Great. And in this little over a year period, what has impressed you the most or what accomplishments do you feel has been achieved by the commission? Or give us some insight as to what this commission is doing and, and what you see doing and what we'll be doing in the future. Well, I'm... I'm very, very excited about the new leadership and the new energy at the Commission. I think that there's a new vision for how the Commission can work with other city departments and also work with outside entities to really bridge gaps in the city. And I think um, in the coming months, I think you'll see much more coming out of the Commission in terms of a larger vision for how the city can really make a better place for children, youth, and their families. There were quite a few programs in place in the past. Mm -hmm. and when we speak to vision, I think that's important because it talks about the horizon and, and mm -hmm. where you're going. But are there any interim accomplishments or, or goals that have been met that you, that you are aware of? Well, I think that there's some, some really important work that's been done with the Youth Commission and some work that will be coming up in the next few weeks here with a, a day of service and kind of learning amongst young people in the city. So I think that there's much more reinvigoration of involving young people and involving all kinds of young people, so not just the young people that are kind of involved in student government, but young people who are of different places coming from different ways and maybe young people who haven't been in school or who are, you know, been involved in other things in their lives. So I really do think that in the year... Uh, that I've been there, there's been a shift to really trying to, to look at youth more than I think in the past. Great. Thanks so much and thank uh, you. congratulations. Thank you. And uh, thank you for your stewardship and your volunteer work. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Wiesar. Thank you, Madam President. And um, congratulations again. Thank you. And here you're doing a wonderful job on the commission. Uh, at the Wellness Foundation, you were involved in youth violence prevention. And the city is actually engaged in a di mm -hmm. discussion about how to provide a improved, coordinated effort on youth development. Any thoughts on what the city is doing at this time? And any thoughts on the commission's role in that discussion? Um, I think that the direction that the city go is going in is a really good direction. I think having a centralized person to work on the issue I think is really, really critical. I also think looking at community-based programs as linkages uh, I think is really, really important and really looking at this as a long-term commitment, not something short-term because one of the things that we found at the foundation that it's not a short-term commitment, it's not a one- or two-year commitment. It's a long-term 
you know, 10, 15 year commitment because it really is about going at it from different perspectives, from a law enforcement perspective, from a perspective of a community, and from really looking at how you reinvest in communities and in young people overall. And I think the Commission does have a, a role to play in really trying to look at some of the programs that have been in existence for a while around schools and school safety and really providing that, that linkage to that kind of earlier kind of prevention. Um, and I think it, it remains to be seen what we could be doing when it comes to young people who may be already uh, gang affiliated or already involved in violence. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I think uh, a lot of what we're doing as a city right now, we're not going to see the, the outcome, positive outcomes for a while. And I know many, we feel like we need to do something immediate. And mm -hmm. there, are, there are some short-term mm -hmm. things I think we could do. Uh, but uh, as I've been uh, on the ad hoc uh, committee that Mr. Cardenas chairs on, yeah. on youth development, I think uh, we, we're, we're realizing that uh, a lot of the things that we're doing now are really five, ten years from now, mm -hmm. we're going to realize, hopefully, if we succeed, that yeah. we see less kids joining gangs and more kids doing positive things in our communities. But I think you bring a wealth of experience and knowledge. I would ask that uh, the Commission, with your knowledge there, and, and prod and urge your other commissioners get more involved in this debate, because I, as I look at the commissioners involved uh, on your commission, a lot of you have a lot of experience mm -hmm. and knowledge about in this area, so I'm looking forward to continuing your involvement as we uh, continue to improve our services to young people in the City of L.A. Thank you. Thanks, Councilman. Thank you very much, and Thank we're you. so pleased to have you on the commission and your leadership. You. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you would please call the roll, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the votes. Twelve ayes. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Next item, Mr. Clerk. Item 54 is the reappointment of Ms. Valeria Velasco to the Board of Airport Commissioners. Good morning. Thank you for coming out to the Valley. Uh, Ms. Hahn, would you like to open up? Thank yes. you. Um, thank you. Well, maybe this is a, a great opportunity, first of all, to thank you uh, for serving on the Airport Commission. And you came to this commission, obviously, with a, a, a very interesting uh, perspective and an interesting burden um, to really continue to be sort of the uh, the champion for the, for the local community. I'd love to hear um, what you feel like uh, we've accomplished so far, and then certainly love to hear you talk about uh, the challenges as we move forward to modernize LAX, to maintain what I believe is a fragile uh, settlement agreement, uh, and, and speak to how our community benefits agreement is moving forward and what challenges we have uh, with that. But may I personally say uh, thank you for serving. Thank you for agreeing to do it again. And uh, I, I think your voice on this commission is extremely valuable and extremely important um, as we walk a very fine line towards nurturing um, what uh, should be uh, the ultimate destination for the airline industry while also preserving people's quality of life who live uh, next to LAX. I asked you a lot of things there, you but did. I, you're a lawyer. You can you can sort it out. I'll, I'll do my best and try to keep it short. But thank you very much, Councilwoman. It's really an honor for me to serve as an airport commissioner, um, especially um, sitting in the Westchester Playa del Rey seat because it's my charge really to uh, look out for community interests. And of course, uh, I'm balancing the community interests and the impacts on the community with being a commissioner and trying to bring our our airport into the 21st century. So. I'm very concerned about the impacts on the community, um, minimizing those impacts as we f go forward with the new master plan when we finally get there, um, and bringing our, our uh, airport up to speed. <laughs> um, we've done a lot. I'm so proud of what we've accomplished in about the last 18 months. We have now two flyaways. We've increased flights at Ontario Airport by 26 flights a day with Express Jet. Uh, we have broken ground on Tom Bradley International Terminal and are moving forward with that, completed the southern runway improvement and are working on the taxiway now. Um, and so those are all a lot of th good things that we accomplished. We have a new executive director who has, I think, a different kind of vision. It's going to take us forward. She thinks out of the box, and I think that's going to help a lot. I do have concerns, though, with regard to where we are in our settlement agreement. Uh, we're way behind. I think we're seven to nine months behind in terms of putting that into action, and that concerns me a lot. 
um, because the farther behind we get, the A380 is looking at other airports to go to, and we really want the A380 to come to our airport. Mm -hmm. We do have two gates where the A380 can land now, so we're prepared for that, um, but we have to keep moving. We also um, turned the midfield satellite into a green light project, so that's great. We'll have at least 12 new gates that we're hoping to get to maybe 24, double that. Mm -hmm. We really need to, so we can get to 78.9 million annual passengers per year. The community benefit agreement, some of those things uh, the FAA did not approve through our settlement agreement, which was unfortunate, but we are still going forward trying to bring benefits to the adjacent communities, Inglewood, El Segundo, Hawthorne, Lenox. Um, as well as Los Angeles, and uh, we are we do have a first hire program, which is a great thing. We are doing uh, soundproofing all over uh, Los Angeles County, so we're making headway on those things. Well, um, uh, thank you, and again, I, I really believe uh, you're at a, a very critical time right now, and we do have a, a new dynamic, passionate executive director, Gina Marie Lindsay, uh, and we have we have a, a, a commission that I think does see the balance that we, we need to achieve. And as you know, I'm a big uh, supporter of really modernizing this airport because I understand uh, that uh, it, it is not servicing the needs of the airline industry right now. And as just as you said, they're making choices right now in terms of their future routes. And they don't have to land anymore at LAX. And, and there's new uh, generation of airliners that actually can fly all the way over LAX and keep going. Uh, so we want to make sure that it's an airport that accommodates the industry. Uh, I was a big believer in, in backsiding Tibet with gates uh, as well as the, as the midfield uh, concourse and making sure that they're the contact gates uh, because we've spent some money, which I think is unfortunate, on temporary uh, gates that are farther out, and the airline industry is not happy about that. But uh, it was kind of a, a stop gap, gap effort. But we know that there's going to be challenges with the uh, with the studies on on, on the moving of the, of the runway, and we know uh, that those are issues that are still very volatile within the the Westchester El Segundo community. So uh, you've got a tough job. You've got a tough job. But you should know that. Uh, for me, on, on commerce, trade, and tourism, I am completely supportive of, of you. I'm completely supportive of just what you said, moving forward to make this the choice of our airline industry, servicing the airlines and their customers. As you know, customs needs a whole lot of help in terms of modernizing its facilities and even looking at the facilities over where Alaska Airlines is because that's uh, part of customs as well, and that's very uh, underutilized and it's kind of outdated and we need to do a better job welcoming the millions of tourists and visitors that see Los Angeles first through LAX yes. and uh, you have a big job ahead but I'm also extremely sympathetic to the surrounding communities I have the same issue uh, in the communities that surround the Port of Los Angeles and we have these economic engines we have these points that are pivotal for our tourist industry, and yet we have an obligation to preserve the quality of life for people who live around these entities. So you have a tough job, but uh, I'm on your side. I'm in your corner. So Th thanks for doing it, Val. Thank you very much, Councilwoman. Thank you. Mr. Zine, followed by Mr. LaBanche. Thank you. Good morning. If uh, Bill Rosenau was here, he'd be saying, great, 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 great. <laughs> That's what he'd say. Great, 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 great. Because you are a great commissioner for the airport. Uh, yesterday, I had lunch with a representative from uh, China Southern and talking about some of the airlines across the globe that don't feel that LAX wants them, that we don't have the welcome at out. And I know that our trip to Asia, the trade mission, we met with some airline executives and they were complaining about some of the terminals and uh, the ramps, et cetera, and how we're going to improve that. Just one thing I would suggest is that we do some extension to some of the airlines that serve other parts of the world that aren't coming to LAX with the expansion that's taking, I shouldn't say the expansion, the renovation is taking place and the A380 is going to be coming in. This particular airline is purchasing a few A380s. Uh, they, China Southern, Southern China, China Southern, China, which are, China, China Southern, Southern, they currently fly to LAX, but uh, there's others that this man was telling me that don't feel welcome. We haven't given the welcome at. And I would just offer that suggestion in the future uh, that there's a lot of business that we can bring in. 
a lot of them, he said they're going to San Francisco. They're not coming to Los Angeles. So I know we don't want to bring in more planes, but we want to, with the A380 coming on board, fewer planes, more passengers, and with the different gates that are going to be established, reduce the number of airplanes coming in, but increase the capacity for the travelers which helps the economy here. So I would just offer that suggestion. It was interesting that we had lunch yesterday and we were talking about this. Um, and he, he's been with the airline industry for many, many years. But just that many airlines that he was mentioning that don't fly into LAX, we could reach out with an extension and try and help that. I know the trade mission that we went to Asia, meeting with airline executives, the common feeling was we don't have a state-of-the-art airport. They want that. They want it for the passenger's convenience. I know with all the security issues that come up, but I know that you've made a great blend on that commission and uh, knowing you from the trip and your your passion for helping Los Angeles I commend you for that and you've got my support for the continuation on the uh, airport commission so congratulations to you thank and you again in Bill Rosendahl's comments a great 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 great, great commissioner <laughs> thank you very You're much welcome. thank you Mr. LeBond thank you very much uh, just a couple of questions there on the thing there how many people now are using Los Angeles International Airport roughly? About 61 million annual passengers a year. And how many of the 61 million just fly into Los Angeles and then go to another terminal and, terminal and fly to Phoenix for the Grand Canyon or, or Las Vegas or some other thing? How I, many? I think that number is about 45 million. So there's Pretty only high. really, so that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a big Quite transfer. A bit, yes. Yeah. Because the, the point I bring is that the recent trip I took to Mexico City. I met with officials of uh, the airlines there, Aero Mexico, and others, and their concern was because they all want to, you know, try to use whatever facility is best. Is the hub relationship that LAX has to the world? We forget yeah. about not just the hub. If you if they're a partner with Qantas, and I don't know if Aero Mexico is a partner with Qantas, but if they are, then they come in and then they get off the Qantas flight and get on the Aero Mexico flight, and they're, you know, it makes. So that's something I don't know if we all realize the importance of the. Los Angeles International Airport is how it relates to that, and also so much freight. How much freight is coming through LA? Um, I, you know, I, I'm not that good on numbers. Right, but it's, it's like right. 47 million annual tons of yeah, it's of a cargo. lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's in the belly of the plane, and we don't realize it's like a not like a freight train. There's a passenger train and a freight train. Well, in airlines, they're together. They're even though we have separated some facilities on the south end of the airline. So I think we have to educate the public a little about that. How is the noise, the future of the noise, whether it affects uh, the southern strip of Los Angeles and uh, South LA County, and uh, you mentioned the other cities closer to the airport as, as well. What is the noise factor on these new planes? The noise factor is theoretically lower when the A380 was in. Um, I live just on the north side of the airport, and I'm at the 65 uh, decibel level where I in, in Playa del Rey. And we noticed on the north side that it was less noise with the A380, so we're hopeful about that. Right. But there are a lot of concerns now with the southern runway reopened. Some of the neighbors in El Segundo are starting to complain about the noise again because, uh, you know, the flights are landing there and taking off. And I've noticed um, in the e at night the, what, the runway, the southern runway is closed because we're working on the centerline taxiway, so more aircraft are coming to the north side. And there were nights where I could not even sleep. The traffic was so loud and so noisy. Right. Well, one time when my wife and I lived in Atwater, we lived two blocks from the rail line, and you, you hear the noise. Right. It's one of those challenges. What city in the United States has the best airport? Have you been able to give us some <laughs> guidance on that? I haven't been to all, all cities, obviously. I understand uh -huh. Singapore has a wonderful airport, and I've been to the airport in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong's fantastic because the train comes right, right into to, it, yeah. to the airport. Well, the old so one used to have to go right down and, and, and land, like, right there. I mean, it was right in the center of the city. Right. And uh, I think where Dennis Sign was... Uh, Southern Airlines in Guangzhou, China, used to land. And then they build these new airports far and out away. They built Los Angeles International Airport far out and away, but in the time the city caught up with it. And it's the challenges that we have now. I stand with uh, Janice Hahn on uh, modernization of this facility. I want to protect uh, neighborhoods as well, but the challenge remains people will pass us. And three things made this city the water that Mulholland and hardworking people brought to this city. Uh, and if it wasn't for water, we wouldn't be here. The Port of Los Angeles, which uh, Phineas Banning uh, helped create, and then Los Angeles International Airport. And those three things are extremely important, which you're extremely important right now. So 
Uh, I think, as Janice said, it's important to have your advocacy there, but there's an issue of greater regional good that we have to uh, solve. And I don't know if my time, I still got some time. Is there any discussion about any airfield in uh, southern Orange County or northern San Diego County at all? Uh, no, you know, San, San Diego is struggling with what they're going to do with their airport. And I heard one of the commissioners say the way they wanted to solve it was to bring their air traffic to LAX. Of course, Orange County does not, you know, have an international airport. And so we're dealing with those factors. That, uh, that was a missed opportunity in Orange County for us. But we all are working very diligently on regionalism. You know, we have flights from Palmdale now to, to SFO. Right. Um, and we're hoping that that will be successful. But the so, business is being driven by hubs. I mean, when I listened to the executives from Aero Mexico, they talked about, you know, we have a hub and they have a partnership, but now it's alliances. So these are the challenges that I don't know if we all realize as a community. Now, I want to ask on the noise factor, is there any way to, because we did this in Griffith Park, all the soil that was from the Burbank Media Center, and Joel Breitbart was the superintendent of the parks planning section, they got the dirt, they made a berm, and now you have a picnic area that's uh, noise lessened greatly with the freeway. Has there ever been thought of a super berm on the north side of the airfield? Oh, there, there could be that. There is On the north side, there already is Westchester Parkway, which is right. below, and then there's a, kind of a hill there. Yeah, right by Fire Station 5. Exactly, but kind right. of what happens is the noise kind of goes up the contour and over the berm or the hillside there, and so people hear it. My house is on the top of a hill, so the noise comes right up to it. Right. You could never build a berm high enough uh -huh. uh, in some of the areas, especially in Playa Del Rey, to keep the noise back. Right. So, so that is a, that is a big problem, but something to consider. All right. Well, okay. Well, I uh, thank you. Uh, back door, Bradley. We're not back door, Bradley. Uh, at this point, it doesn't look like it. It's uh -huh. pretty expensive, but it's still we're still taking it's everything into consideration. Uh -huh. It's not off it's the, not table. the table. Yeah. So. Well, I just think it's important to look at that. I think Tom Bradley would want it. Tom Bradley was a great leader of the city, and he welcomed. Uh, so many people in this city, and there's a lot of people around this horseshoe who are products of Tom Bradley's influence. Anyway, uh, thank you for being a great commissioner, and uh, do the best job you can for the people. And looking at the long range, trying to protect the safety of the, of the traveling public as well as the continuity of a neighborhood that uh, is right around there and impacted by that. Thank you very much. It is a big charge. I agree with that. Um, I really want business to come to our city and to continue uh, to do that because our city is such an important, beautiful city. But I'm charged with you know representing the community, so I'm balancing that. And sure. just one last comment is you know when you look at our airport, we're the fifth busiest in the world and the third smallest geographically of the international airports. So in and of itself, we have an inherent problem. Right, exactly. It, uh, so it's very tough. It's a very challenging airport. And I would support if you wanted to put people on an airplane from your community to show examples, whether it's Denver or or, or some other airport some other relationship, get the community to see it as well. Because sometimes we make decisions, and it would be nice to share them, get them to see some of the challenges of what could be done. Madam President, I thank you. Thank, thank you Bye -bye. very much. Thank Thank you, Val. Thank you, Mr. LeBanche. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Madam President, and good morning, Mr. Vasco. Good morning. I uh, first want to thank you for your uh, volunteer and your, and your time. Um, last October, November, we had a series of uh, hearings uh, to the Committee of Ad Hoc uh, youth gangs, and in that process, we had some of the uh, administrators from the airport respond to us regarding jobs. Now, this morning we saw hospitals st stepping up, removing tattoos from the bodies of youngsters who are trying to get out of gangs. Father Boyle makes it real clear: the best way to stop a bullet is through with a job. Uh, we did a study where thousands of dollars of of uh, our contracts, our resources through the airport to the harbor leaks out of this city into other parts of actually outside of the county. As an administrator, I mean, as a person who oversees the administrators as commissioner, have you seen any meaningful effort from the administration to address our ability to create jobs for young people? 
You know, I'm not involved in every aspect of the airport, but I know there is at least a beginning effort for that. And what I'm really looking for as a, as a commissioner is to increase that. But we have an opportunity. We're redoing our concession program, and we really have an opportunity there to, uh, to include local businesses, local community people, to work in our concessions and throughout our airport. That just doesn't include, you know, retail sales, but that includes uh, many different uh, sources in our airport. And we're really going to push hiring youth, and I'll look into um, more seriously and find out information about what's going on with uh, helping former gang members and disadvantaged youth to get jobs at the airport. I know this council has been looking at the notion of putting as a performance uh, factor on these executives who run these operations that are dealing with billions of dollars. Um, one of the uh, variables would be their performance and how successful they are in creating jobs for young people for the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Is that a factor that you would want to see when we review our executives and their performance on an annual basis? I would. Yes, I would. Great. Yes, especially if it's going to include youth and, and minority then that's disadvantage. That, I'm hoping that's a direction we can take as a body. I know that's a discussion and something we work through our chairperson of personnel uh, of that committee, Councilmember Zion. But that's a direction I think we need to take as a body to make it very serious that we don't want just a public relations gesture, that we want real dollars going into back into our city to create jobs. And I thank you for that support. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. I just want to add, Val, um, your uh, leadership um, prior to being on the commission and being on the commission has been a wonderful addition. I think you've heard from this council that the importance of modernization and balancing that with community needs and to make sure we have a fir first class uh, and world class airport. Uh, so thank you for your leadership. So, Madam Clerk, thank you please very much. open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the votes. 11 ayes. That item has been approved. Congratulations. Thank, thank you, Val. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Next you. item, Madam Clerk. Item 32 called special by Councilmember Hahn. Thank you. Ms. Hahn. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam President. I know we have some cards. We have some people that, that have come here to speak on this item, but I thought I would maybe lay it out a little bit uh, uh, for us today. Uh, I've introduced a resolution to support um, SB 947, which is the container fee bill. And I, I will tell you, this is a bill that I hope passes both houses and is signed by the governor. Last year, uh, it passed both houses and then the governor vetoed it based on some objections, mainly from the business community. Uh, but if, if this bill passes and, and is signed by the governor, it will generate $465 million a year uh, that will be split 50-50 between mitigation e efforts, efforts to clean up our air, as well as um, efforts to reduce congestion. Uh, and this will be a fee on every container that comes through the ports of L.A., Long Beach, and Oakland. And for a long time, I think there were many of us uh, that certainly feel like uh, the, the ports are the economic engine, not just really of this region, but of, of the country and of the, of the global economy. But every container that comes through those ports, and right now there's about 14 million that come in and out of those ports on an annual basis, every container, uh, in my mind, represents commerce, but it also represents uh, risk. And it, it represents a risk to our security, and it represents a risk to our health and safety. Uh, you know, uh, California Air Resources Board uh, did a study uh, last year that said in, in 2005 there were 2,400 premature deaths because of cargo-related pollution. That there's about a million days of lost productivity in the workplace because of cargo-related pollution. There's 350,000 missed days of school because of cargo-related pollution. So while it's a great generation uh, of uh, economic development, it also is, is jeopardizing our health and safety. This bill would say, rightly so, somebody needs to pay for cleaning up the air, somebody needs to play, pay for improving the infrastructure so that the congestion, the landside congestion, doesn't also 
contribute to the pollution. And we think uh, those containers ought to pay. And ultimately, it will only add pennies. Uh, if they pass that on to the consumer. Just pennies per product, uh, because so much product comes through each container. It will not be a burden on the consumer. But there are some concerns about this bill, which is why I've introduced three amendments before we can support this bill. Um, the first one, the, the bill currently places uh, the California Transportation Commission in charge of determining uh, which congestion projects get funded? Well, we just sort of had a bad experience here locally with the with the California Transportation Commission. Uh, remember how uh, ultimately we didn't uh, get what we wanted, the funding in the, the 101, the 405, and we had to scramble, we had to re-lobby, we had to really uh, ramp up our efforts because, you know, if Sacramento or Northern California makes the decisions on where that money is going or which projects is funded, we usually come out on, on the short end. So one of my amendments is that a local entity be responsible for um, deciding which projects should be funded. One of the, the examples is the Alameda Corridor Transportation Authority, uh, which would also be expanded to include representatives from Riverside, Orange, San Bernardino counties, um, and each county's transit authority. That makes a lot of sense uh, that locally we decide which projects should be, be funded. Um, the current bill also currently only allows funds raised from the container fee to be spent on rail projects and grade separations, which are important. And we know that the more uh, rail projects we can build, those containers ultimately should go from the ship to the rail and to their destination. That's the cleanest way to do it. And grade separations uh, really reduce uh, uh, pollution from idling trains, idling cars, idling trucks. But th this amendment also feels uh, like some of this funds should be uh, spent on repairing two of the distressed bridges right near the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, the Gerald Desmond Bridge and the SR-47. Uh, those are important for goods movement, I, I will tell you. So one of the uh, amendments is that the funds are allowed to be spent on that. doesn't guarantee that they are. It just says that those bridges would be eligible for funding under this bill. The third amendment um, is to remove language that would penalize the ports of L.A. and Long Beach for missing deadlines set out in the San Pedro Bay Clean Air Action Plan. As you remember, a historic agreement between the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles uh, that set out guidelines, timelines, benchmarks for reducing emissions um, at the worst polluters in, the, in this region, which, which is Long Beach and Los Angeles. The bill basically says if they don't meet those, their own um, their own uh, guidelines, their own timelines, that they will be penalized and they will lose access to infrastructure funding if they're unable to make these benchmarks. The port has concerns with that. Initially, I had some concerns with that. It seems to me we're penalizing uh, the ports who voluntarily agreed uh, to this Clean Air Action Plan. It doesn't have any teeth right now, so the Coalition for Clean Air says, hey, it's a nice plan, but if there's no teeth to it, how do we know that they're really going to make the efforts to reduce emissions? Uh, but we think uh, penalizing them by not giving them access to the very funds that would actually improve the infrastructure, which would help them to get cleaner air, uh, is problematic. So those are the three amendments that uh, I have introduced that we would support this bill if these amendments were in it. I want to support this bill. I want this bill to pass. It is such a step in the right direction to finally have a container fee. So every time we see those containers coming through our ports, we know that each one represents real dollars to clean up our air and real dollars to improve the infrastructure so that good movement is no longer um, a liability to those who live in and around the port complex. There will be some concerns um, heard today. And uh, I want to let everybody speak, and then um, let's talk about how we can maybe get everybody on the same page so that we have a real strong voice in Los Angeles so that uh, Senator Lowenthal will know that our position is strong in support of his bill. Thank you for the extra time. You're welcome. Uh, we, we gave you the six minutes since you were the maker of the motion. Oh, thank so. you.
You're only 30 right, seconds over. Yeah. a lot of time. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> okay, I'd like to call up the following speakers. Uh, Mar uh, Martin uh, Schleider from Coalition, Jack Kaiser, Brian Jacobson, um, and then I'll call the three following that. Ready? Hi, uh, Martin Schlager with the Coalition for Clean Air. Uh, appreciate that impassioned uh, speech. Uh, it is how I feel as well. Um, it is uh, an example of the vocal support that you've given this concept. Um, and the reason uh, we're here today is because uh, the councilwoman continues to push uh, so that the city can be in a supportive position on this bill. That is our ultimate goal here, to have both the city feel comfortable with this bill and also for the bill to have, uh, have momentum and to have, as you said, the signature of the gover governor so that this is uh, ultimately uh, the law and we are beginning to make these needed investments. And it's, um, and it's because this bill is the best funding proposal that's been on the put on the table to date that it is of it is of such concern that we do it right okay doing it right means bringing this we we are aware of the city's concerns as you've spelled them out in these amendments and we're not entirely aware of how that resolution looks and we need some assurance here that those resolutions don't risk either regional or community level support in order to get the city of LA. So we just basically want to bring folks together to be on the same page with a few more details. The detail about the uh, Alameda Corridor Transportation Authority is, is a new one presented here. It wasn't in the latest draft of the amendment. So I think we're getting to those details. We need Lowenthal's feedback and we're going to be able to get there and I would just encourage that we take a little bit of time and time that we have in the assembly process now uh, up in Sacramento to be able to resolve that and all be on the same page so we can go forward and really win the improvements you're asking for. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Jack Kaiser, followed by Brian Jacobson, followed by S. David Freeman. Madam President, member of the council, uh, point of small order, I did have an accident and I want to compliment LA Fire Department Unit 209 for doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Anyway, I'm Jack Kaiser with the L.A. County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we're watching what's going on with our port complex. We know that we have to do congestion relief. We know that we have to do environmental cleanup. We cannot depend on the federal government. We know that the state government, the bond money, isn't going to go too far. So the Lowenthal bill right now looks like the best way to go. Uh, we agree with uh, Councilwoman Hahn's uh, uh, amendments because we think it's uh, a way to go to get local control to make sure we solve our problems. One thing that we like about the Lowenthal Bill is we feel it's very, very democratic because containers that go through the ports of L.A. and Long Beach go to every state, every congressional district in the United States. As the Councilwoman has said, they are America's ports, so America needs to help us clean up our problems. I know there's opposition, but I think we can get around it. Uh, uh, we can make the retailers understand that it's not going to kill them. So this is why we want to move ahead with this, and we need to move quickly because uh, every day that we don't take action, there's a little bit more pollution, a little bit more congestion that haunts us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jack. Brian Jacobson, S. David Freeman, and Alex Pugh. Good morning. My name is Brian Jacobson. I'm with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, I, too, would also like to express uh, my dissatisfaction with uh, uh, the comments that the council member, council member Han just made regarding the bill. Uh, it's clear that there is quite a bit of common ground already going into this uh, meeting with, re with respect to what the bill uh, says. Uh, notwithstanding that, though, I think I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about um, a little bit about what the uh, well we've heard we've heard the statistics um, they are indeed alarming and there is is indeed a public health crisis and an environmental crisis down at the port um, at the same time in the, and that is the backdrop against which uh, Senator Lowenthal drafted the legislation and I would like to take this opportunity to remind the council that Senator Lowenthal um, the legislation itself um, from its inception, uh, recognizes and acknowledges that there are competing interests down at the port. So, which is why uh, 
again, for, right from the inception, there is uh, half of the fee goes to environmental uh, air pollution mitigation, and the other half already goes to infrastructure. So we must keep in mind that the bill itself is not an anti-growth bill. It is a pro-growth bill. All it says, though, is that the growth must be sustainable. Um, it must be green. Uh, that is the growth that is funded from these particular fees. So with that in mind, I think we have to uh, – that is the basis of our of our objection to the uh, to the to the amendment, specifically with respect to the bridges, because the Gerald Desmond Bridge, as I understand it, and, and again the uh, uh, the information on the bridge actually has been not so easy to, to determine at this time from the port from the port of Long Beach, but that uh, that's going to increase highway traffic. It's going to pour more trucks into the local near dock facilities, and it's going to put more trucks on the highways. And it's not a, this is not supposed to be a truck bill. Thank you. Thank you. David Freeman. First of all, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the City Council for giving me the privilege of public service uh, in my 80s. Uh, I just wish for all of you the opportunity to continue to be in demand at that stage of your lives. And it's a real privilege, and I, I just have never had a chance to thank you. Uh, Mr. Cardenas especially was the chair of the Oversight Committee at the time. Uh, and I also want to remind everyone that we have taken very seriously the mandate of Mayor Villaraigosa and this city council and Ms. Hahn, who's worked on this uh, forever, uh, to have green growth. Uh, the fountainhead of cleaning up the port are the two ports not Sacramento. And uh, while uh, we uh, want to uh, support uh, the good senator's bill, and we certainly support uh, Ms. Hahn's amendments because they're vital to uh, the bill being implemented effectively, uh, we are engaged night and day in a massive effort to clean up the port, and we're in the middle of the largest fight that this city has taken on in a long time to reform 16,000 uh, dirty trucks uh, with uh, a workforce that, shall we say, is unstable, and, and to try to tighten homeland security uh, so that while uh, it's useful to have the people in Sacramento join our parade, uh, the leadership of that parade is this city council and, and our uh, mayors and, and, and the local effort. Uh, if we sat around and waited for the California Air Resources Board to clean up these ports, it would be a cold day in hell. So I, I just want, uh, want to be sure that everybody understands that uh, we are do cleaning up our own house, and, it, and state legislation can be helpful. Uh, but I'm here to pledge to this council on behalf of our mayor and our commission that we're going to get the job done, period. And, and that uh, we, we won't certainly do not want to see the funds that are collected go to Sacramento. Yeah. I mean, uh, that <laughs> is so foolish as to be laughable. I mean, yeah. uh, Mr. Alcon, who just recently returned from there, will back me up, I, I yeah. think, that uh, we dare not <laughs> let those guys get their hands on the money uh, because Thanks. we are not sure how it will be allocated or, or when. And, okay. Uh, therefore, the local control is vital. So I'm here to uh, support my boss lady, Ms. Hahn, and uh, thank the council and, and uh, want everyone to recognize that uh, uh, we are doing the cleanup job, and those folks up there can help us. And we could use their help, but we'll get the job done. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. appreciate you being here today. Alex Pugh, followed by Brendan Huffman, followed by Ka Colleen Callahan. Good morning, Council Members. I'm Brendan Huffman with FICA, Valley Street and Commerce Association. Alex Pugh left a few minutes ago from the L.A. Chamber. Um, I staffed this bill for several years while at the L.A. Chamber, and my new organization, FICA, uh, continues to oppose this bill. That being said, I want to say that um, these amendments that Ms. Hahn has brought forward present an opportunity uh, that should be taken seriously. This is one of the handful of bills that I've seen since I've been spending time in Sacramento um, 15 years ago, where there's so much division between the business community and the environmental community. 
the amendments that Ms. Hahn has suggested, I think, are an opportunity to bring some sides together as they achieve the goal, some of the goals of both of both sides. Um, I want to also want to clarify that I am not authorized to speak on behalf of this huge coalition of business groups. I'm just playing along and trying to help this process. I also want to caution you as you um, consider container fees that first, it's not a $30 container fee, it's really a $60 container fee because the TEU, um, it's two TEUs per container. Also, the international shipping community usually considers container fees as a tariff. So there's some international laws there and some of the shippers have told uh, the Chamber, Vike, and other groups that there will be a lawsuit filed if this bill is ever signed, unless it's amended. So here's where I think the sides might be able to come together. One, I love, um, well, let's see, I, I like the, uh, the new funding mechanism that the, the, the money would be taken out of the CTC and put into more of a local authority. Also, if, the, if more of the container fee could be put into national security, as well as infrastructure improvements, I think you might see some of the shippers and business groups modify their positions um, and some of them drop their opposition. When you have infrastructure improvements, the air quality improves because we start relieving congestion in the diesel corridors throughout Southern California. Thank you. Thank you. Colleen. Colleen Callahan. Good morning. Colleen Callahan with the American Lung Association of California. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I want to specifically thank Councilwoman Hahn for her impassioned speech and her dedication to clean air and green growth. We do appreciate that. Um, it is clear that we have a lot of common ground on this bill. Um, however, we do have some concerns with the amendments. Um, so with, you know, with all respect, I do just want to address some of those concerns. Um, First of all, I want to state the importance of this bill. The Port Investment Bill is the top public health bill for the American Lung Association in California because the bill will find fair and balanced solutions to the crisis, the public health crisis caused by pollution from port operations. So we're firmly committed to ensuring that the funds generated from this bill are directed to air quality mitigation as well as sustainable infrastructure projects such as grade separations and on-dock rail. Currently, the resolution um, as proposed, or the City Council resolution proposes amendments that would fundamentally alter the purpose um, of the bill. And uh, so I want to speak to, uh, to your concern with um, specifically the um, accountability of the bill. Um, we do not believe that SB 974 will fundamentally penalize the Port of LA of Long Beach. Rather, um, we think the bill would provide justifiable accountability for the goals outlined in the Clean Air Action Plan that we support and have worked with the ports and other agencies to support um, and move forward. Um, and then also, um, as my colleague from NRDC mentioned, we do have some concerns with the, um, the resolution or the amendment um, to direct funds to distressed bridges. Um, we, th we think that this could lead to funding of major port expansion projects instead of sustainable projects and the prioritization of on-dock rail. So um, just wanted to you know, mention those concerns, but in general, we we're very, very thankful um, of your support and um, look forward to working with you more further. Th Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Smith, Mr. LeBonge, uh, Ms. and Mr. Cardenas. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I think it's very important to realize that what Ms. Hahn has brought forward are very important uh, uh, amendments. As you heard, the business community and the environmental community come together and say there are issues with this bill that need to be addressed, and we need to take a second look at it. Uh, when we were in Washington a few months ago at the League of Cities, a number of us went to the White House to meet with the environmental uh, staff at the White House, Mr. Reyes, Mr. Zine, and myself. The very first thing they said to us is, Los Angeles, you guys haven't got it yet, but you're never going to meet the federal attainment requirements. And as long as your air gets worse, we, the federal government, may come down very hard on your harbors and may have to take away a lot of that shipping and close down portions of your harbor. They made it very clear to us we have major problems in L.A. I think this bill will help in a long way go to resolve those issues of the air quality standards in the harbor, particularly the fact that that harbor is the polluting, main polluting source for all of Southern California, is the biggest polluter in all the South. 
And we need to do something serious about that. So this bill goes toward that. But when we hear from the communities, and people I have great respect for out here today, Mr. Slagler and, and uh, certainly Jack Kaiser and, and David Freeman and others, when they say to us we need to fix some things in the bill, I listen because those people I have great respect for. And so I think we're on the right track with Ms. Hahn's amendments. Uh, Ms. Hahn, do you want to send this back to committee or you want to resolve these with these amendments here today? Uh, whatever your wish is, I'd be happy to assist you and get that done as quick as possible. It is not the end of the road for this bill. It's gone through the one house. It is in the other house. There are still committees yet to go through in the next month or so. So we have time to have the city heard on this. And we're the biggest issue on this bill is the city of L.A. I mean, we are the major uh, contributor to the problem. We also get the major benefit from it. So I think it's important for us to weigh in with those amendments that Ms. Hahn brought forward and give us an opportunity to be heard on a bill that affects L.A. more than any other city in the state of California. And so I thank you, Ms. Hahn, for bringing those forward. And whatever she wishes to do, we can either do it today or send it back to the committee. I'd be happy to assist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Mr. Labonge. Mr. Labonge. Mr. Cardenas. Um, th this issue is, is very important. I want to thank Councilmember Hahn for uh, bringing up the flaws in this legislation because the fact of the matter is this legislation does not uh, protect the L.A. Basin in the sense that right now, as the bill stands, if the Port of Los Angeles that has over 17 million containers a year were to generate uh, the money off of those 17 million containers. That money doesn't mean that it's going to go like to the city of Los Angeles. Oakland could use a portion of that money. San Francisco could use a portion of that money. And let me remind you, unless it's written in statute, believe me, the boards that control this money will put the money where they choose. This legislation needs to be written in a way that the money generated out of the Port of Los Angeles needs to be utilized for congestion, air issues, and those matters for the port and community of Los Angeles. As Greg Smith said earlier, people might not realize it, but even Washington is saying, you're on thin ice, folks. You need to get your act together. You need to recognize your responsibilities. And if you don't, we will come down on you hard. And then we're going to be sent into a tailspin where the economy is going to be affected. The air is probably not going to get that much better. And we're going to have bigger problems than we have today. So I think it's important that we only support this bill if it's amended, but amended properly. Let me give you an example where people have short memories and they don't want to take care of their responsibilities. When I was in the state legislature, I found out that the Central Valley of California, they have a lot of air quality issues that they need to address. San Francisco, however, that is right there on the ocean where the wind blows conveniently and much of that ends up in the Central Valley, what they produce in air quality issues do not stay within their air basin. Therefore, their air basin requirements are nowhere near what they are in the Central Valley. Yet it's San Francisco that's contributing to a big majority of the problem. But yet they don't have the restrictions on the production of those air quality problems that the Central Valley has. So my point to you is this. We need to make sure that the point source problems are addressed by the point source solutions. If we don't do that and if this legislation does not have those containments, I can guarantee you this. You will see a tremendous amount of resources to be uh, drawn out of Los Angeles. They will not come back to Los Angeles. And the worst part about it, it's not just about local control. It's not just about taking care of our own business. It's about us not being able to address the big problem. For example, if Oakland has two and a half million containers a year and Los Angeles has 17 million containers a year, I can guarantee you that Oakland is not producing the amount of air problems in Oakland that we have in Los Angeles. But if we generate, say, $100 million and $50 million goes to Oakland and $50 million stays in Los Angeles, it's going to take longer for us to address the problems in Los Angeles. We need to address the issues now. This bill does have some good effort into it, but it's not appropriate for us to, approve, to support it unless we make sure that the money stays where the problem is created. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Labonge. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say to all who are here, work for the best goals that we all could share, because there's a lot of people who are working. 
that's real important about that port is I referenced when the commissioner who was uh, reappointed water and power, Port of Los Angeles Airport, build the economy of this region. And to try to find that and make a, 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 a aggressive uh, changes for the health and welfare of all people, uh, both from the from the okay. personal standpoint, but also from the community standpoint of Southern California. And also, I want to thank uh, the Commission President David Freeman uh, for his uh, thank you of us. It's uh, we uh, collectively thank you for serving as a commissioner, but also thank you for thanking us uh, for the opportunity. And I hope to live to be 80 plus too. That would be a big uh, big treat. Thank you, Madam President. We hope you do too, Tom. So, uh, Ms. Hahn, to close. Thank you. Um, well, well, thank you, everyone, for for coming down and speaking on this. And I, I do. It's very gratifying to me that finally we have everyone really understanding the um, the, the economics of America's port, but also the, you know, the negative impacts of America's port. And uh, I know there's still some issues with, uh, with some of the, the folks that came down here today. And I really believe that we want to support this bill. And I believe Los Angeles is a huge voice uh, in Sacramento on this bill particularly. So what I'd like to do today is um, send it back to your committee, Greg, if you would agendize it quickly. And then I want every Everyone, I want the chamber. I want Jack Kaiser. I'd love to have VICA, uh, Coalition for Clean Air, American Lung Association, uh, all of you with uh, Senator. We probably could get the senator's staff. Uh, let's sit down. Let's all commit. Uh, the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, let's commit to sit down maybe in this next week and sit around the table one more time to see if we can, uh, you know, exchange ideas, educate each other on our issues, and see if we might not come to maybe a, a compromise so that we have one strong voice with our environmental community, our business community, and certainly with uh, the Ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. If we could have that one voice on this bill, then I think that would be very powerful. I think that would be very meaningful. And I think it would give it a better chance of not only being passed, but ultimately being signed by our governor. And then, and only then, uh, will we finally take a huge step forward to fixing our infrastructure and cleaning our air as we move forward uh, with the incredible growth, the incredible growth that is projected to come to these ports in the next uh, decade. So that's what I would like to do. I'd like to have your support on that. Thank you. So I think that will be the order. Mr. Smith. Uh, we, we have an agenda coming out uh, Monday for f next Friday, IGR committee. I'll put that as item number one. Thank you. So this item will uh, be sent back to committee, um, and we'll come back. Thank you all for, for being here today. I'd like to uh, ask us to reconsider item 49. Uh, Ms. Perry has an amendment. Uh, if we could open the roll on reconsideration, close the roll. Tabulate the votes. Eleven eyes. Ms. Perry. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair or Madam President. Uh, this is just a, a technical change to a motion regarding the uh, triathlon for the city of Los Angeles. Um, this changes the finish line uh, and the reference to it to a transition uh, area as uh, the participants go into the last leg of this very grueling event. So it's not substantive. It's just a technical change. Seeing uh, no uh, questions on that, uh, Madam Clerk, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the votes. Eleven ayes. Thank you. Next item. Item 34 was called special by Councilmember Alicon, and an amending motion has been circulated. Yes. Mr. Alicon? Yes, members. This is um, obviously aimed at uh, reducing the emissions, uh, which is a, a very good cause. The legislation, however, um, specifically e eliminates the use of um, uh, diesel fuel commercial motor vehicles uh, manufactured prior to uh, January 1994. My concern is that uh, that uh, there are thousands of uh, truckers who uh, may be driving vehicles that are prior to 1994 and before we. Uh, eliminate those from the fleet that moves goods uh, from the port to parts throughout the nation, uh, we ought to have a, a sort of view of what the in impact is going to be both uh, economically and, and socially. Uh, my fear is that there are a number of 
of truckers who will not be able to perform their service, and, and it could disrupt uh, our local uh, economy related to the port. Um, so, and, but I'm, I'm huge on, on the issue uh, uh, of reducing the emissions uh, uh, and have demonstrated that, I think, in my career. But um, if we're going to truly be advocates for solving the problem, then we ought to be advocates providing resources uh, to solving that problem. Uh, and so uh, many of these truckers uh, will need assistance. Uh, when in, in, uh, we held a hearing on this several years ago, and we uh, determined – that uh, the the income level for many of these truckers is less than thirty thousand dollars a year, uh, and uh, to put a new motor in, it's going to cost at least four thousand uh, dollars. To get a new truck, could cost uh, upwards of eighty thousand dollars, and uh, this could cause incredible disruption at our port. Uh, so uh, I, I think that we ought to encourage the legislature to amend this legislation to include uh, some resources to assist those uh, sole proprietors. Uh, who are driving these trucks to be able to transition uh, into uh, cleaner vehicles, uh, and I'm all for that, uh, but to just shut them off uh, without an opportunity to transition I think is unfair. There should also be some time frames uh, set in statute that allow them uh, to transition over time. There's no provisions for that. Uh, so I'm deeply concerned uh, that this uh, – uh, this well-intended legislation uh, has not uh, uh, has uh, does not take into account some very uh, real situations that we have at our port in Los Angeles, and I would encourage. Uh, and I, I'm pleased that uh, uh, Council Member Smith has agreed to second my motion to amend. This is a very friendly amendment, uh, and again, it's intended to improve the air quality, uh, but doing it in a way that uh, uh, has less impact on our on our economy. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just want to echo what uh, my uh, colleague um, and, and also former colleague, uh, former Senator um, Alarcon, on the matter of this is an important issue. This is a good bill in the sense that it's trying to address air quality and it's trying to get rid of our worst polluters when it comes to heavy diesel trucks. Yet at the same time, as Councilman Alarcon just pointed out, how do you go ahead and tell a small business that they have to do away with their equipment over, literally overnight without giving them any incentive, without giving them any opportunity to go ahead and do that? Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to decimate someone, you're going to decimate families, you're going to decimate business, and you're going to actually have negative impacts on the community. Granted, you'll uh, hopefully improve the air quality to a certain degree while you're doing that. I think there's a better and mo more honest way to do that. And when I say honest, the state of California for many years has been investing in giving incentives, for example, for personal vehicle users and governments. Back in the day, for example, when we had the electric vehicle on our streets, what, that, what was going on is the state of California was setting aside $30 million a year to give incentives to several thousand dollars per vehicle that was purchased in California. Why can't we do something along those lines with these businesses so that we can get the dirtiest diesel trucks off the roads? Why can't we take it one step further and maybe have Mr. Jones improve the bill, uh, excuse me, Assemblyman Jones improve the bill to the point where they, the state of California can also give incentives beyond that and say, you'll get a certain amount of credit if you turn in your old vehicle, take it off of service and get a cleaner newer vehicle better yet how about if you get the most cleanest diesel vehicle will give you even more incentive to do that be it some kind of tax credit be it some kind of reimbursement because we do do that ladies and gentlemen with your tax dollars we should do that that in this instance as well in addition to that we should probably engage somebody like the chamber of commerce and the banks to go ahead and put together a program where they will actually finance these vehicles to make it easier for these people to transfer transition from their old vehicle to a newer, better vehicle, cleaner vehicle into the future. So there's a lot more that we can do to responsibly clean the air, yet at the same time give at least some kind of respect and appreciation for these businesses that are actually helping to drive our economy. I think it's very important that this bill be improved and modified, and the only way that I think we should uh, support this bill is if 
it's amended. Amended with those kinds of amendments, amended in a way that has an appreciation for the environment, yet at the same time some incentives and ability to realistically get these trucks off the road. And as it stands right, th right now, I think it would be very, uh, I don't know if the, the governor would even sign this bill in its present position, in its present form anyway. So we need to get in a better form, and I think the, the Council of Los Angeles should send that message to Sacramento, to the state legislature. Thank you very much, Mr. Cardenas. There are no further speakers in the queue. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you uh, please open the roll? Okay. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. All right, next item, please. Madam uh, Chair, if I could ask, uh, item number 50, which is a report that I was going to give on our sister city program, be uh, postponed a week from Tuesday, if that's good? So you're re requesting a continuance on that item? Continuance. We've got to reconsider to continue, correct? Mr. Clerk? All right. Motion to uh, reconsider without objection. To open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. The item is to be reconsidered, Mr. Lamont. To have a more detailed report as it be continued to the Tuesday of the a week from Tuesday. All right, I believe we have to vote on uh, the continuance now. Which would be that would be July seventeenth. Correct. Just continue. Okay. The item is continued. Next matter. Item 45 was called special four cards from the public. All right. Our first speaker is Sharon Brewer, followed by Miriam Fogler, and then Donna Pierman. I don't see Sharon. Sharon? I don't see her. I guess not. Anyway, she is going to speak on this. The important thing is, is that we're reading here that we have a lawsuits in the L.A. Fire Department. We need all the money we can get. And uh, I spoke to um, one of the council people here. Uh, I think it's, it's number 12. He told me that the private, the private companies that, that get funding from the city should repay the city back. And people, you should be uh, itemizing, making sure all those companies that are paying this should be repaying us. How do you expect to give raises to your city workers who work very hard? You, your tree people, you you give accommodations. All the city workers and DWP and uh, the LAPD, LA Fire Department. If you want to have good people working for you, you need to pay them good wages, and that means having the callers every year and not wasting our money on these special events. This is a whole waste of time and money, and we meantime we need to also be training our, you know, DWP who are, who are electrician, electrical specialists. You know, it's not an easy job getting up on top of those poles, climbing up those poles. It's very, very hard work. Electrical me uh, mechanics, very hard jobs. So we need that money to be acquisited and acquisite in, in our city here. We need it to fund our jobs here so that our youth can take over for tomorrow. You know, we're getting older every day, folks. We're, we need people to replace us, okay? You want to leave this world a better place when you, when you, you came in it. Coming, when you go out, you want to make it better. That's what God gave us to do to, to here to serve, to serve God, okay? And that's what we're under here. And, and that's why we have the 4th of July. And that we don't need to be spending all our money like this. So we need to take account of everything we're spending on this special events. Thank you. Donna Pearman is our next speaker. Okay, yeah, thank you. City Council loves to waive fees. Maybe I shouldn't have paid off my credit card and had the city waive my fees. And, uh, it's not that these particular events are a bad thing this time, but the CRA is taking a lot more from our city, and our city is getting bankrupt. We can no longer afford to waive event fees. We'll have to tell our kids, sorry, CRA took our money, no event, no fun. Close the roll, tabulate the vote, 11 eyes, let it go forthwith. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you would please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 eyes. Next item. Item 52 was called special four cards from the public. Our speaker, only speaker on this item is Donna Pierman. I didn't understand the event at first. 
I mean, of the thing at first, but now I can see that it's a good thing. So I just want to say it's a good thing to have a Frida Kayla day. At least she was doing something more than I can say about her uh, self-satisfied rich councilman. Thank you, relatives of Frida Kayla and for women everywhere. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clerk. If you would please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, our next item. Council has motions for posting and referral. Motions are posted and referred. The desk is clear. All right, very good. Um, are there any announcements? Mr. Alarcon? I, uh, I just want to reiterate about the uh, contest at Big Bob's Big Boy in Burbank uh, to benefit, uh, hopefully, the Holy Cross Tattoo Removal Program. If you want to vote for the uh, Providence Holy Cross uh, Tattoo Removal Program, uh, I, I think I, uh, because of my uh, technical, te technological weaknesses, uh, I gave the wrong information. Uh, so uh, if you want to, if you can vote uh, by uh, uh, going online at www.bobsnet.com. Uh, I'm sorry, bobs.net. That's let me let me start over again. www.bobs.net and click on charity. Then you can vote for the tattoo removal program and hopefully benefit a lot of young people who want to get out of the gang lifestyle. Thank you very much. Are there any other announcements, members? Uh, if not, would we uh, all please rise for adjourning tributes? No, I'm sorry. Ms. Han, do you have no, a... No, I'm sorry. Okay. Any Mr. Parks? Madam uh, President, I'd ask that we adjourn in memory of Elias Blake, uh, who's a former college president who passed away uh, uh, June the 11th in Washington, D.C. at the age of 77. Uh, Mr. Blake was a living legend as it relates to uh, uh, education. He was the uh, president of Clark College in Atlanta for 10 years, 77 to 87 a professor, a scholar uh, in the, uh, as an analyst in Washington for more than 15 years uh, with Howard University. In 70, uh, he published a study uh, in which it reflected that 70 percent of all African Americans with bachelor's degrees or uh, graduate degrees had come from the historical black colleges. Uh, this prompted the then President uh, Nixon to pull a meeting together of several college presidents and they created uh, a major funding stream for higher education uh, and expanded the support of predominantly black colleges. Uh, he was instrumental in developing the Upward Bound program that basically uh, educated a number of high school students and uh, directed them into college. Uh, he also, uh, uh, when he grew up in the South, uh, certainly at 77 he grew up under a great deal of poverty and also uh, experienced firsthand racial discrimination. Uh, he lost both of his parents at the age of 12, but continued uh, living with his grandmother and, be and received his uh, higher education. Uh, in addition to being the president of Clark uh, from 87 to 92, he was the director of the Howard Division of Higher Education and Policy Research, uh, and he also was a variety of other activities. Uh, he survived by his wife, Mona, of 43 years. Thank you, Mr. Parkson. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to second that. Are there any other adjourning motions? Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam President. Um, in 1994, when my home was destroyed in the Northridge earthquake, I hired Randy Witt. Uh, some people in the Valley may know Randy. He works for VICA. Uh, by the time he owned a construction company, and I hired him to rebuild my house. During the 12 months that we were out of our house, Marshall Witt, his father, was a construction supervisor on my home. Uh, Marshall passed away on 24th of June of this year after a long fight with cancer. He was born in Chicago, Illinois, went to Marshall High School, not the one here, but Marshall in Chicago, and uh, the Illinois Institute of Technology. He uh, built homes across the country and settled here with his son, Randy Witt, uh, built a lot of shopping centers, a lot of homes, uh, was a really interesting man to talk to. And I enjoyed uh, when I would go out to see my house while he's working on it, talking to him. He was very worldly, understood politics to the highest level, to the very low level, understood what we did, and um, 
uh, was a very engaging man and very, very charming man. Uh, he passed away, uh, he was born in 1929, passed away uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, to his family, I extend my personal uh, regrets. He was a good friend and a good man, and he will be missed. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. No, no further adjourning motions then. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you would please call the roll. All right, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.